for Communications Commission testified Tuesday about plans to expand access to high-speed data networks, also known as broadband. The FCC wants to connect 100 million households lacking broadband today. The plan is a part of the $787 billion economic stimulus package that was passed last February. Rick Boucher of Virginia is a chair of the Commerce Subcommittee on Communications and the Internet. This is about three and a half hours. The subcommittee will come to order. Good morning to everyone. This morning we welcome Chairman Jenankowski and the members of the Federal Communications Commission as we hold the first in a series of hearings that focus on the National Broadband Plan. In the Economic Recovery Act of 2009, we directed the Commission to prepare a plan to expand broadband access and increase broadband adoption among those who have access to it. Today, the United States stands 16th among developed nations in broadband usage and for the benefit of our national economy and our quality of life. We simply must do better. The Commission has done a superb job in developing the plan, and I want to commend the members of the Commission and the professional staff who have devoted a year and I know thousands of hours to listening to public comments and carefully constructing the blueprint before us. I think you've truly done a superb job. I'm going to comment this morning on several core recommendations of the plan and uh, then recognize other members. First, I was pleased to observe your proposal to transition the high cost fund in the Federal Universal Service Fund from supporting exclusively basic telephone service, which is what it does today, to also supporting broadband deployment. The Commission's recommendation very closely tracks the provision in the comprehensive universal service reform legislation that for the last four years I've been working with our committee colleague, Mr. Terry, in order to advance. We've been through a series of discussion drafts, the most recent of which was uh, the subject of a legislative hearing in the subcommittee. Today, universal service monies may not be spent for broadband. Our legislation will immediately allow carriers to use their USF monies for broadband deployment. We also have in our bill a mandate that carriers receiving universal service monies provide broadband throughout their service territories within five years of the measure becoming law. The carriers could no longer receive USF monies if they fa fail to meet this broadband build-out mandate. The Commission's recommendation also targets using the high-cost fund for broadband, and I commend the compatibility of the broadband plan and the legislation that we've placed before the committee. Secondly, I was pleased to note that the plan incorporates the recommendation that we set a high goal for future broadband speeds. Today, the typical broadband service to the home here in the United States is between three and five megabits per second. In countries like South Korea and Japan, today's data rates for the typical subscriber are far higher, often reaching between 50 and 100 megabits per second. The Commission's plan appropriately sets a goal over the coming decade of delivering to 100 million homes in the United States broadband speeds of at least 100 megabits per second, and I commend you for that. Third, the Commission's proposal for auctioning the, to commercial bidders the D block of the 700 megahertz spectrum without onerous conditions is commendable. The proceeds from the auction could then be applied to helping first responders purchase and install the equipment that is necessary to bring to fire, police, and rescue agencies nationwide a truly interoperable telecommunications capability. It's essential that when they converge from different localities on the scene of a disaster, that fire, police, and rescue be able to communicate one with the other. We're 10 years beyond 9-11. That capability does not exist on a nationwide basis today. I offer to you my support for obtaining the appropriations that will be necessary in addition to the proceeds from the D-Block auction. 
in order to complete the build out of first responder communications equipment. I think that on a matter so fundamental to the nation's security, we will have bipartisan support for the provisions of the money necessary for the purchase of public safety equipment. Finally, I want to commend the approach that you take in your plan to work with television broadcasters to identify the spectrum they now hold that on a consensual basis could be repurposed for commercial wireless use. Broadcasters whose surrender spectrum would receive compensation in exchange for a voluntary spectrum transfer. That, Mr. Chairman, is the right approach. We will soon pass here in the House our bipartisan bill to direct you and the NTIA to conduct a comprehensive inventory of the entire spectrum that could be used for commercial purposes. That inventory will offer a clear path for the next steps in making available adequate wireless spectrum. Uh, and that spectrum will be necessary to meet our nation's rising demand for wireless services. You've done an outstanding job in preparing the plan, and we want to thank you for joining us here this morning in order to discuss your recommendations. That concludes my statement, and I'm now pleased to recognize the ranking Republican member of our subcommittee and our partner in so many telecommunications initiatives, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me welcome all the witnesses and, and let you know how much we appreciate taking your time to come here. This is a very important hearing. We do this uh, regularly, but this is, I think, very appropriate considering we just got the broadband plan from all of you. Um, I uh, have a lot of ideas. I haven't been through the whole plan, and uh, my staff has been through it. We have marked it up and uh, done an analysis. Uh, I think all of us would agree that broadband is critical uh, to our economic growth, and certainly the goals outlined in the plan are encouraging. Um, you know, on page uh, 10, it mentions goal number four, Mr. Chairman, which I think is is really exciting to think that every American community should have affordable access to at least one gigabyte per second broadband uh, service to anchor institutions such as schools, hospitals, and government buildings. And you mentioned this, but I think uh, all of us in America would not even comprehend what would happen in this country to its productivity and to the innovation and technology if we had one gigabyte. Uh, so, as you mentioned, uh, oftentimes we get less than five megabytes through uh, our broadband today. So I think this goal is outstanding. Um, it's important for the Commission to recognize that much about our broadband market is working well. And that perhaps is my theme this morning, and that the plan should complement what is working rather than scrapping, what, scrapping it. Uh, key findings, according to the report now, that 290 million Americans, 95% of the population, today have access to at least four megabytes per second broadband service, and two-thirds of adults subscribe. So approximately 200 million subscribers have broadband at home today, representing a 25-fold increase in the last 10 years, up from 8 million. By comparison, I just asked the staff to, to look at this, it took 90 years to go from 8 million voice subscribers to 200 million under the old Title II common carrier regulations. So that should tell you something. This plan confirms that the free market pro-investment national plan we already have in place for broadband has worked considering how quickly we've moved. All the FCC need do then is remain focused on the 5% of households that otherwise may be uneconomic uh, for the private sector to serve. What Congress and the FCC must do is revert is not do is revert to failed regulatory ideas that were designed for old technologies in a monopoly era marketplace, such as imposing network neutrality for forcing access to facilities and regulating rates are the surest way to deter the investment we need to reach this new broadband plan and ultimately the goal of one gigabyte uh, here in America. If we don't impose regulation on broadband providers that discourage private sector investment, we can meet the FCC chairman's goal of making 100 megabyte per second service available to 100 million households by the year 2020. So we must carefully avoid any investment killing in government interventions and avoid any attempt to reclassify broadband as a Title II service. Um, I think the plan as we went through it is obviously has some very good points. Um, 
And I want to thank the chairman for answering my letter I sent to him. And it was nice to get the letter before the hearing. Um, and we appreciate his response. Uh, as he pointed out, uh, that the plan cost $20 million to create. And I'm concerned that we had to spend $20 million to confirm what a lot of us knew was that we're working, but I think it's worthwhile to get uh, this perspective in this report. Uh, it could end up saving us more money as we move forward if we, uh, that our pro-investment approach continues and we refrain, as I mentioned, from uh, putting burdensome regulations in place. Now, of course, this does not mean that the government has no role and the plan uh, can help us in this way. Two approaches in the plan show particular promise. The uh, chairman mentioned this. The plan proposes to cut the waste in the universal service program and refocus it on the 5% of the country that does not have access to at least four megabytes per second broadband. If we're going to subsidize the broadband, uh, concentrating on the seven million homes that are uneconomic for the private sector to serve makes sense. Uh, second, the plan seeks to make 500 megahertz of spectrum available for wireless broadband within 10 years. That's good. So long as the FCC does not give the spectrum away uh, or rig auctions with conditions, uh, uh, then we'll advance, I think, our broadband goals while generating needed federal revenue. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, the, the broadband spectrum on the part of the broadcasters um, uh, will be looked at carefully, then if they have to relinquish anything, it will be on a voluntary basis, uh, so we let that work itself out. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for this hearing, and I look forward to the testimony of our commissioners. Thank you very much, Mr. Stearns. The Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Boucher, for scheduling this important hearing. The release of the National Broadband Plan was eagerly anticipated over the last several months, and I'm pleased that the committee is examining its recommendations today. The National Broadband Plan is the most significant and amb ambitious infrastructure program for America since the interstate highway system. Our competitiveness and prosperity depend on meeting its core objectives. America cannot settle for the second best in the digital age. Writing this detailed blueprint was a massive undertaking, and I commend Chairman Janikowski, the broadband team, the FCC staff for the open, transparent, and data-driven process they used in preparing this report. Now comes the hard part. The real test of the plan's success will be in its implementation. <coughs> Congress, the FCC, and the administration all have a role to play. One important aspect of the plan is the recommendation to enhance public safety by building a new inter interoperable broadband network. According to the chairs of the 9-11 Commission, quote, the FCC's plan offers a realistic framework to move forward, and we hope that all stakeholders will work with the Commission to refine the plan as needed and make it a reality, end quote. I've asked my staff to begin drafting legislation to implement the sub public safety recommendations. We'll work in close consultation with subcommittee chairman Boucher, ranking members Barton and Stearns, and other members of the committee. Significant funding will be needed to effectuate the concepts outlined in the plan, but I believe we must find a way to move forward on a bipartisan basis to meet the needs of the public safety community. The plan identifies a looming shortage of spectrum as a major problem facing the expansion of wireless broadband. Members of the committee will have different ideas about how to address this issue. As we will hear today, the broadband plan makes a series of recommendations for freeing up spectrum. These deserve, these deserve our serious consideration. As the plan recognizes, there is a pending legal challenge to the Commission's ability to regulate broadband networks. The outcome of that issue could have serious implications for the Commission's ability to protect consumers and implement the plan. Whatever the court rules, the Commission should take the steps it deems necessary to ensure it can implement the plan and to ensure that broadband consumers are protected. There are other key recommendations in this plan. We need to take steps to safeguard consumer privacy, ensure transparent and accurate billing, provide access for disabled Americans, and reform the Universal Service Fund. I hope today's hearing will be 
only the first in a series of hearings on the future of broadband. We could benefit from additional hearings that will focus on individual aspects of the plan, including creating a public safety broadband network, reforming universal service, improving spectrum policy, providing better access to persons with disabilities, eliminating barriers to deployment, and promoting broadband adoption throughout the country. I look forward to working with Chairman Boucher and other members of the subcommittee as we move forward. I thank our distinguished panel for being here today and appearing before the committee, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Waxman. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, is recognized for five minutes. I thank the uh, distinguished subcommittee chairman. Would ask unanimous consent to put my entire statement in the record. Without objection. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman. Um, I'm just going to summarize because we want to hear from you folks on the FCC. First of all, um, if you have to have a federal broadband policy plan, Y'all have done about as good as can be done. Um, but it's kind of like the old movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Um, the good news is you, you, you say some things that I think need to be said. You try to reform the Universal Service Fund. Uh, you try to free up some, uh, some spectrum, as Chairman uh, uh, Waxman just alluded to. The bad, the worst idea I have heard in years is reclassification. I just... I don't know about anybody else on this committee, but uh, I don't want to regulate broadband like we regulated telephone services in the 1930s. I just don't want to do it, and I don't think the country wants to do it. Um, as far as the ugly part of it, just generically, you know, Mr. Waxman talked about the interstate highway system as an infrastructure program, and he's right about that. If the federal government hadn't decided to, to do the interstate highway system, we wouldn't have had that type of a system. But 95% of America has broadband, and the federal government hadn't had to spend a dime. This isn't a have-have-not program. This is a uh, find something for the FCC to do that makes sense in the 21st century program. So. Um, some of your components are things that I think we can work together on, but overall, um, you know, as everybody knows, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And y'all are trying to fix something, and in most cases, isn't broke. So, with that, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, yield back. Again, I want to commend the Commission for working really hard, but you've produced a work product uh, that we can use as a roadmap, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Thank you very much, Mr. Barton. The uh, Chairman Emeritus of the Energy and Commerce Committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingell, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and I commend you for holding today's hearing. I want to uh, also commend Federal Communications Commission Chairman Genahusky and his team. They've completed a roadmap to ensure broadband reaches every corner of the United States. There are two elements that should be the core of this, element, of this effort. First, it should focus on promoting broadband adoption. Second, it should establish and address a support mechanism for broadband's expansion into high cost and underserved areas of the country. I'm pleased that the National Broadband Plan includes chapters on these issues. Nonetheless, I have great concerns about several of the plan's recommendations about spectrum reallocation and competition-based issues. At best, these matters are ancillary to the Congress's intent to expand national broadband access. At worst, they would reinstitute the old policy fights since uh, long since satisfactorily settled. In November of last year, I wrote the Commission to express my misgivings about reallocating spectrum from broadcasters to mobile communications providers. Over-the-air broadcasters surrendered nearly a third of their spectrum to facilitate the recent transition from analog to digital signal transmission. Further loss of spectrum can have a very serious adverse effect on the public by limiting consumer choice. With respect to broadband television, this potential outcome 
would also reflect a marked weakening of the long-cherished principles of diversity and localism. My father and I have defended these since the Commission's establishment in 1934, before considering whether, if, or how to reallocate frequencies used for television, it behooves the Commission to work with NTIA to complete a comprehensive spectrum inventory, such as the one mandated by H.R. 3125, the Radio Spectrum Inventory Act. I consider this a necessary predicate for the Congress's consideration of the National Broadband Proposal to grant the Commission the authority to conduct spectrum reallocation incentive auctions. I have also serious apprehensions about the plan's chapter on competition issues. This chapter is an unpleasant reminder of old arguments from the 90s. At that time, the Commission required that local companies should make their networks available to all manner of carriers at below market prices. This so-called unbundling resulted in a glorious mess. My colleague, uh, Mr. Billy Tozan, and I moved legislation through the House to eliminate unbundling requirements with respect to carriers' investment in broadband facilities. The Senate, as it is unfortunately oft want to do, did not pass this eminently sensible legislation. But the Commission ultimately adopted the bill's essence in its triennial review of 2003. The result has been enormous investments by carriers in broadband, both in my own state of Michigan and across much of the nation. Chapter 4, the National Broadband Plan signals the communication of the Commission's intention to revisit the unbundling statute. This, I think, is to reopen an old fight, and it gives me great concern because it can very well serve as a disincentive to necessary investments in broadband facilities. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I would like to remind the witnesses today that the Congress is the sole progenitor of the Commission's authorities. To quote Sam Rayburn, uh, if the Commission it remembers it works for us, everything will turn out fine. In keeping with the sentiment and concerns I've just articulate, articulated, I, respect that, uh, I respectfully suggest that the Commission stay focused on the Congress's simple goal of ensuring that broadband is accessible and affordable to all Americans, rather than to seek to rehash old and unproductive policy debates and to start counterproductive fights which are quite unnecessary. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. I ask unanimous consent to uh, submit letters to the Commission to finish out the questions that we will need to ask today, and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Dingell. The uh, record of this hearing will remain open for members to submit additional questions in writing to members of the FCC. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, is recognized for two minutes. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, Mr. Upton, who is pr prior to my time. Uh, all right. I'm sorry. Mr. Upton, uh, you're recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, Commissioners. It's good to see you. The uh, trend in telecommunications sector is towards development of advanced technologies and increased competition. Uh, DREG, Elation has successfully promoted investment, innovation, and more competition, benefiting consumers uh, to no end. Ninety-five percent of Americans now have broadband and more than one choice of carrier. That statistic, along with more than $100 billion uh, recently invested in the infrastructure, speaks for itself. So as Mr. Barton said, not only if it, if it ain't broken, don't fix it, so it, as it works, let's not break it. It's clear to me that as the level of competition in the market increases, the amount of government regulation should decrease. And I would hope that we all could agree that markets, in fact, have done a better job of protecting consumers than the regulators do. And in a competitive market, we should permit market forces to work and not interpose government regs between providers and consumers. All that does is impede the competition that we all want to see. I applaud your goal of providing 100 million homes with access to 100 megabytes per second broadband by 2020. And I believe that we can do that without regulation. The level of deployment will only come, however, with, robust, with the continued robust investment by the private sector. And I would agree with Chairman Dingell 
that the FCC, the, for example, the FCC sh uh, re uh, requirement to carriers to unbundle their fiber, that goal will not be met by this legislative body. Don't change the rules after investments have been made. Don't put up roadblocks to new investment. Finally, I have some concerns about spectrum repacking proposals that could cause harm to consumers and broadcasters. As a result of the DTV transition, broadcasters returned over 100 megahertz of spectrum to the government and at the same time increased their services. Yield back my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Upton. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And uh, congratulations uh, to the Federal Communications Commission, to you, Mr. Chairman, all the commissioners. Uh, when I put the language in the stimulus package mandating that the Federal Communications Commission had to return this as a report back to the American people on the future of broadband uh, just 13 months ago, I can tell you right now that you met the highest expectations which I had uh, when I inserted that language uh, into the law. Uh, and the table of contents is just an indication of how thoroughly you have examined this subject. Health care, education, energy in the environment, economic opportunity, government performance, civic engagement, public safety. This is as thorough a compendium of the issues that we have to work on in order to make sure that America once again regains its position as number one in the world in broadband as could ever be asked to be put together. We have dropped from second uh, to 15th in the world, behind Luxembourg, behind Canada, behind Finland over the last eight years. Uh, what we saw was incumbent companies going to court, going to the FCC, chipping away at the pro-investment, pro-competitive rules that we had put on the books. And as that happened, we saw slowly but surely the United States slip step by step into a position where the rest of the world looks at us uh, over their shoulder. And this gives us the opportunity with this plan to once again regain that leadership. Google, eBay, um, Amazon, Hulu, we branded this made in the USA in the 1990s, but we have been slowly but surely slipping behind. So this is an incredible plan, and if it is fully implemented, both uh, uh, investment and consumer protection uh, will be uh, unleashed in a way which will guarantee uh, that the American people will be, in fact, the country that the rest of the world looks to with envy. And we thank you for that, and we want to work with you to ensure that it is fully implemented uh, so that we can regain that competitive edge uh, that gave us uh, that incredible position that we enjoyed and now has slipped from our grasp. We thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. We thank the Commission for being here. Thank you very much, Mr. Markey. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad I waited and followed my friend from Massachusetts because, um, uh, as far as I know, this is a product of the chairman. It's not a product of the commission. There's no vote on this plan. And I think we're going to hear that through the questions today. Not that the chairman didn't put a lot of time and effort in this and his staff. Uh, I want to debunk this 16th or 25th place. You've got to be joking me. Liechtenstein, Monaco, Qatar, Malta, Bahrain, Luxembourg, Hong Kong, South Korea, Iceland, Singapore, St. Kitts, Nevis, Macau, everyone in the top 20, we could fit the 25 in the continental United States. So we got to get off this aspect of comparing apples to oranges. And it's like saying the city of New York has it, and so we're fine. This, this, we have 95% of our people have broadband. 5% do not. You know where they're at? They're in my district. You know what? The stimulus fund is not going to them. And the RUS fund's not going to them. And that's what torques people off. 95% of us have it. It's the private sector that's rolled it out. And now we want to take over one-sixth of the economy, another one-sixth of the economy, through moving this whole information age from Title I to Title II, the dirty little secret back here, it's already been exposed. We're not going to get a surprise from the chairman this time in the hearing because it's here. Some commenters have suggested a second approach in which the SEC 
would implement certain plan recommendations under its Title II authority. So let's have this hearing, let's have this debate. The system is working where it's not working is in rural America, which we spend billions of dollars and the money's not going there. And we've got the rollout, we've got the stimulus rollout, we're overbuilding places that have broadband right now with our tax dollars and it's not going to where it's needed. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Shemkus. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for moving so quickly uh, to schedule this hearing and welcome to uh, the entire uh, Federal Communications Commission. Uh, I've read the plan. I want to congratulate you. I think it's a bold one and I think it's what our country needs. On this issue of where the United States uh, 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 is ranked in the world, according to the International Telecommunications Union, uh, 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 they have measured the United States and they say that we have slipped from 11th to 17th between 2002 and 2007. Uh, we know that our standing in the world is not a source of pride to us. Fewer than 27 out of every 100 Americans have uh, broadband service compared with, uh, uh, with uh, much better numbers in other countries. Um, but today we're going to hear the plan, we're going to ask questions about it. Uh, I, I'm very pleased that uh, uh, many of the priorities that I've uh, kind of pounded away on uh, over the years are contained and um, in the plan. It really reflect my own legislative agenda. Uh, I hope we'll move expeditiously on the broadband uh, conduit bill, uh, which I call the digging bill, uh, which will ensure that federally funded uh, transportation projects uh, require laying the broadband infrastructure so we don't have to dig up what we've already built in order to uh, lay down what we know we need. I also look forward to the subcommittee's fast-tracking consideration of the next generation um, 911 bill that my colleague uh, John Shimkus, and I know in his uh, fright about uh, where we are or where we're not, uh, he would have mentioned this. We introduced the bill two weeks ago. Uh, I'm ready to vote on a um, thorough and complete reconstruction of the Universal Service Fund and its programs so that we essentially can leapfrog into the 21st century. America has always led the world in countless ways. And uh, that's what I find so exciting about the plan, because it is a roadmap, a plan on how we can get there. We also need to decide the future of telecommunication services and their individual classifications so that we can ensure that consumers are really properly protected and that competitiveness is encouraged. Uh, no matter who I meet with, they're always for competition unless it cuts in some way to the competition that, um, uh, that they have a, uh, uh, a total hold on. We need an aggressive agenda, as I said, because the United States really lags uh, badly. Uh, so I look forward to hearing from uh, each one of the commissioners. This is going to be a lively debate, but at the end of it, uh, I think what we all, uh, our common goal must be is that there is competition, that every person in the country is reached uh, by 2020 with high speeds, not with this lagging speed that somehow people have a source of pride about. I, I don't. I don't think it's good enough for our country. And uh, I look forward to working with ev everyone to accomplish this for our country. So thank you for a job well done. Uh, it's broad, it's visionary, and it's bold. I think it's exactly what we need to be talking about. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Eshoo. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Bono Mack, is recognized for two minutes. Good morning, Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, and Commissioners. I, too, would like to thank the FCC for its hard work on the National Broadband Plan. It is clear that a great deal of effort and thought went into uh, this endeavor. As I review the text, I see some real opportunities for the committee and the Commission to work together to increase investment and opportunity. In a general sense, I believe that the plan's approach to, uh, to spectrum use and universal service are quite promising. Further, I believe most of us would agree that the goals of the plan are admirable. After all, who among us doesn't want to facilitate capital investment and increase their constituents' access to broadband? However, like the broadband plan, members of Congress also have goals. As we all stare at high unemployment rates in our districts, my goal is to support policies that create jobs for my constituents. 
Therefore, I have to question portions of the plan that seem to imply the need for a heavier government hand. I personally remain unconvinced that a sector of our economy, which is continuing to attract capital investment and reach more American households, is in need of more government interference. As a matter of principle, I believe broadband and the high-tech sector are best served if the Commission and this committee enact policies, policies which incentivize capital investment and promote greater economic freedom. Additionally, I strongly believe we need to take great steps to protect the digital content that is driving consumers to broadband. The creators and owners of content should have their property protected by law, and we should reward entities who work to ensure its protection, not punish them. When I read sections of the plan which call for relaxing such protections, I become very concerned. Finally, I would like to caution the FCC on pursuing any agenda without solid legal authority. One certain way to stifle investment and stall economic growth is to make decisions that, are, that create uncertainty in the marketplace and encourage litigation. Again, I'd like to thank the Commission. I look forward to the question and answer uh, portion of, of today's discussion. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Bonamac. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for convening the hearing, and welcome to the Commission. Uh, the National Broadband Plan hits a number of important issue, issues, such as public safety interoperability, transitioning the Universal Service Fund towards broadband, and freeing up additional spectrum for com commercial use. I want to focus on the plan's recommendations for the construction of a national interoperable public safety broadband network. The plan's recommendation identifies an issue I've been highlighting for years, the need for a funding mechanism for the construction of an interoperable, interoperable public safety network. The plan calls on Congress to establish a grant program within a year to assist in the construction of the network and create a funding mechanism. If the FCC is intent on moving forward with auctioning the D-block spectrum for commercial use, we should use 100 percent of those funds as a down payment on building this network. The FCC has recognized the need for public funding, provided an analysis of the capital expenditure costs of the network and projected ongoing maintenance costs. Now Congress must act. Congress must act to establish a long-term funding mechanism that pays for the maintenance costs of the network and ensure that it covers all Americans. Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, thanks for holding this hearing. I look forward to discussing with the Commission how we can move forward on the public safety provisions as well as other provisions in national broadband. And if we have time, a question or two, hopefully we'll be allowed to uh, ask a few questions on the FCC Collaboration Act that we've introduced to bring a little sunshine so we can do our job quickly, more efficiently, more effectively, and protect the public interest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stupak. The uh, gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the hearing, and I want to welcome the Commission. We're so pleased that you are here. Needless to say, we have all been following what you have done with the, the broadband plan, and we are anxious to have a discussion with you. I, a couple of quick points among my biggest concerns with the broadband plan is uh, how these recommendations will affect private investment, innovation, and jobs creation. And because of this, I really am anxious to drill down a little bit deeper with all of you. You all know my district in Tennessee and know our creative community there and their continued expression of concerns with uh, the availability of broadband. And in this vein, uh, Chairman Jenikowski, uh, I, I agree with Chairman Barton on this. I, I was hoping for stronger and more definitive language closing the door on reclassifying broadband under Title II. And instead, I have really found the language to be ambiguous and I am hopeful that we're going to see some changes there, or could see some changes there. Again, uh, investment is a concern that I have. And as we all know, a reclassification to Title II is nothing more than a stepping stone for implementing net neutrality, which I believe would be detrimental to a thriving telecommunications industry. And before I yield back, I also want to flag for each of you a concern over what I think is a, a kind of a, a pretty toothless uh, effort in the plan to curb copyright infringement. And I applaud your acknowledging the illegal distribution of copyrighted content 
being a problem, but I am anxious to get your thoughts on how we can put a little bit more heft uh, behind that and continue to protect the innovations of those that are bringing next generation technologies and uses about and also of our creative community, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Blackburn. The uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Uh, I was always taught that if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. And looking over the broadband plan, uh, I have to say congratulations. Uh, you all have passed. Uh, there's a lot of policy goals outlined in the plan. It sets the FCC on a bold plan of action, and it gives us in Congress a few things to do also. I'm not going to run down a laundry list, but I think that the plan to promote competition is much needed and well received. Competitors need access to wires and spectrum in order to deliver more affordable and more innovative services. Additionally, the plan for universal service fund reform is well thought out. I hope that the Commission also takes this up as soon as possible, even without a new bill out of Congress. Chairman Janikowski, uh, you have a lot to be proud of in this plan, and I want to congratulate you and your team for their hard work, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Doyle. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Griffith, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to submit my opening statement for the record. Without objection. Just a few comments. I never thought I would ever see the FCC commission. Fifteen years ago, I found an FM frequency and <laughs> put it up for public notice. And seven years later, we got it on the air. <laughs> so you can see that I'm not pro-regulation. Uh, but I do believe that the report is done with, uh, with a good heart and, and with the American people in mind. I recognize that the competition that exists in the marketplace today has accomplished a great deal. And I hope that uh, as we go through these hearings, and I'm sure the debate will be spirited, uh, we have in mind that uh, there's not a whole lot we can do to improve what has been done or in the spirit of what has been accomplished uh, by private private industry and investment. It's been significant. So I appreciate you being here and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Griffith. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling today's hearing. I'd also like to thank Chairman Janikowski and the other commissioners for being with us today and for their work on the National Broadband Plan. I'd also like to commend the FCC broadband team for their hard work and thoughtfulness in crafting a bold and visionary plan. Though no plan of this magnitude is perfect, this plan demonstrates American leadership and will serve as a blueprint for the world to follow. I'm particularly pleased that the plan aims to close this nation's digital divide by recognizing the fact that millions of Americans, particularly in such economic times, simply cannot afford the high cost of broadband. Last September, I introduced the Broadband Affordability Act that would expand the USF Lifeline Assistance Program for universal broadband adoption to help ensure all Americans living in urban, suburban, and rural areas have access to affordable broadband services. I applaud the FCC for including my proposal as a central recommendation to increase broadband adoption rates among lower income households in the National Broadband Plan. In doing so, we'll take a major step towards closing the digital divide, and I look forward to working with my colleagues and the FCC to make this a reality. The plan also recognizes the importance of allocating more spectrum into the marketplace and ways to improve our nation's education, infrastructure, health care, public safety systems, as well as our anchor institutions, and promoting competition in our economy. The plan recognizes the critical role that broadband plays in moving our nation toward a more sustainable path of greater energy independence and efficiency by including a series of recommendations to modernize our nation's smart grid. I plan to introduce legislation in the coming weeks that will complement many of the FCC recommendations on smart grid so this nation can promote a smarter electric grid that empowers consumers to make choices that can save us energy and can save them money. I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues and the Commission 
on overseeing and implementing many of the important initiatives recommended in the National Broadband Plan. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Matsui. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, is recognized thank you, Mr. for Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you holding this hearing. Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here, and commissioners, appreciate your input. Uh, on the broadband plan, uh, I felt that uh, it, it lays a good overview. Uh, generally, I think it brought it from just a nebulous maybe 50,000 down to the 10,000 foot level, not really uh, getting into the super granular activities or details, uh, which I felt was good in the sense that that may signal that we actually have a role in Congress. And that's the theme I want to state here today is, uh, well, I think you've done a good job of incorporating especially USF. Um, I think Congress needs to take your plan, use that as the recommendations, um, but we need to do our job in Congress. Um, frankly, I don't, uh, I'm uncomfortable with just saying, you take the lead on all of this stuff, we're not going to deal with it. I think the opposite, the role is for us to do it, and I'm going to take your plan as recommendations. Uh, on the Republican side, we've heard a lot about uh, private sector involvement here, and I want to make sure that uh, when I read the plan, I read that, yeah, you, there's some regulatory type of uh, uh, policies outlined that we will have, hopefully, great debate within this committee, uh, committee on. Uh, but let's not uh, short the private sector here. Uh, $60 billion per year by the private sector in rolling out high-speed broadband in this nation should not uh, be glossed over. Uh, we did... Uh, Nine, eight to nine billion in the stimulus package over two years. So government spending in subsidy of broadband rollout is a small percentage. Uh, and if we start thinking that government's going to be the answer in rolling this out, we aren't going to get this plan adopted. Uh, so with that, I will yield back. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Terry. The gentleman from California, Mr. McNearney, is recognized for two minutes. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this important and timely hearing. And I want to commend the Commission for your hard work on this. This is a pretty comprehensive plan. You've worked hard. Um, the plan clearly in includes many uh, important issues, but I'm only going to be able to focus on a couple of them. Uh, a large part of my district has been severely hit by the economic downturn, uh, and promoting job creation is my highest priority. Uh, it's, it's significant that many of the companies uh, in the telecommunication industry are still expanding uh, and even in the economic downturn. So there's something here that we want to capitalize on. Um, I'm very excited by the job growth creation potential that implementing this plan can produce uh, and uh, vigorous investments by private sector coupled by sensible policy uh, will clearly benefit our entire nation. Uh, and finally, I'd like to uh, ask the commissioners to discuss briefly the issues pertaining to spectrum allocation and uh, special access. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. McNerney. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, uh, I hope we get to some resolve here of, of where we're going. And I think Title II reclassification is... Uh, dangerous at best. Just the fact that this plan exists has put a shiver of cold in the investment community about where we go in broad broadband development. We often want to talk about what has made America great. It wasn't the United States Congress. It wasn't the executive branch. branch. It was private entrepreneurs putting capital at risk and making things happen. And the reason we have and, they're, and they're, my friends on the other side of the aisle say 27 percent or whatever figure they use, is because the private market is going to pursue a plan that allows a return on the investment so they can go to the next phase of that investment. And any time that we seek to stand in the way of that, we're going to get a horrible outcome. Uh, and just the notion that we're even talking about going to net neutrality, more regulation, I mean, if you look at why it took so long for wireless to get to where it is and phones to get where it is is because they based the original uh, uh, rules, regulations, and laws on the Common Carrier Act for railroads in 1897, and we applied it to phones. 
This is exactly that same kind of iron horse tech, uh, uh, regulatory ideas on an industry that is changing so fast we can't keep up with it. I mean, satellites are going to get ready to go to 4G here pretty soon. What we ought to do is get out of their way and let competition reign the day. Uh, the reason those other countries did it the way they did is because they don't have economies like the United States. They don't have the kind of investment and investors that the United States does. There is a marketplace here that is attracting money. You, it, my fear is if we continue down this path, we will stop that investment. Uh, and I think we'll do far more harm than good. Doesn't mean there's not a role for government. I think we can work on those things. But the very principle and idea that you've thrown this into the, this uncertainty in the marketplace, I think is a little bit dangerous uh, to what I think is competitive development of broadband. And I would yield back my time. Look forward to Thank having Thank you very much, Mr. Rogers. The uh, gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll associate myself with a portion of Mr. Rogers' remarks, except, except to say that I think what's made this country great are free markets, but structured free markets. And uh, I appreciate the hard work that the Commission has put into this plan. It can certainly be improved, but it provides, I think, the type of structure that we need to make sure that the type of um, robust capital investment that we know is going to build out our broadband system is done in the, in, in the fairest means possible. I would just like to associate myself with remarks made with with respect to the issue um, of uh, online piracy. Um, and I understand um, that in the open Internet Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, uh, the Chairman has stated very clearly that the Internet and this new broadband platform should not be a shield for uh, violations of the law and copyright infringement. But I think you're hearing from both sides of the aisle that there's a little bit of dissatisfaction on the amount of, um, uh, of focus in this report on uh, that issue. This uh, country is losing um, billions of dollars every year to Internet piracy, and the trend is going in only one direction. Uh, as much as we can ask content providers to do, ultimately, I think the solution largely lies um, in the hands of those distribution networks that are going to take advantage of what is now a partially federally funded broadband network. And so uh, I, I think you're hearing from a number of people that we'd love to hear s some comments from the Commission on um, how uh, we think we either revise the plan or add to the plan with respect to piracy um, uh, in order to, to guard copyright moving forward. But all in all, uh, I, I would uh, agree with uh, many of my colleagues to say that this is um, uh, a product of, I think, great labor um, and I think of great importance for the rollout of broadband in this country. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Murphy. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blunt, is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, uh, remarks for the record. In addition to that, I'd just like to say that uh, the comments that I made and others made at, at our hearing on this uh, last year about uh, unserved versus underserved areas uh, continue to trouble me uh, as we go into, uh, uh, into uh, defining what unserved areas are. It does seem to me that in rural areas particularly you run the great risk of making that service untenable because you create a competitor in a marketplace that can barely uh, handle one provider. I'm concerned by that. I'm concerned by uh, what net neutrality as it's uh, in this plan that might lead to uh, needless regulation, unbundling mandates. Uh, all of those things discourage uh, the uh, build outs in the areas that we need them. I do think that the universal uh, service reform and the spectrum planks of the new plan uh, probably keep us away from that regulation if we focus on them instead of the other things. But, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ms. Stearns, thanks for holding this hearing. I hope that we do become vigorous and active partners with the Commission uh, as you now look at the work product you put before us uh, and that we don't make the kind of mistakes that slow down the great expansion that we've had uh, in broadband over the last few years. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Blunt. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to thank you for convening this hearing and thank the five commissioners for coming forward today to have this conversation with all of us. Uh, I, too, have a copy of the plan. I must concede that I have not written, read every word of it, but I certainly plan to. Uh, it is a very comprehensive plan, and I want to thank you for your work. 
Uh, from what I can understand, the plan states that 95 percent of households in America uh, do indeed have access to broadband, while 5 percent, one out of 20, uh, do not. Well, my district in eastern North Carolina, the rural district that I represent, is home to many of those households who are without very basic access to broadband, with commerce, education and communication being just a few of the everyday tasks that are moving online those who cannot access broadband become further disenfranchised and unprepared for achieving a successful and productive life. It is particularly important that efforts be focused on connecting the unconnected uh, first uh, so that students, teachers, job seekers and others like those in my district have the opportunity to play on equal footing. Less densely populated, economically depressed areas like much of my district are no less in need of access to quality broadband and are certainly no less deserving. I hope we can build on the plan's goals and recommendations. The National Broadband Plan enumerates six long-term goals with hopes of achieving them by 2020. The goals are indeed very ambitious but certainly achievable so long as government moves quickly and responsibly to update its communications policy framework while partnering and in empowering private industry to robustly invest in network expansion and improvements. I would like to note the extraordinary private investments made to building the networks we use every day. As Congress and the FCC move forward, it is important uh, we take that investment into account when crafting policy uh, around the goals of the plan. For example, between 06 and 08, AT&T, a very responsible corporation, invested more than one $1.2 billion in my state of North Carolina in an effort to enhance and improve our networks, uh, increase regulations and mandates on the companies that built these networks with their private dollars may not be the best way to achieve the goals of the plan. So it is critical, in closing, uh, that policymakers and regulators work in concert, that is the key word, work in concert with private industry when drafting those policies. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The uh, gentlelady from uh, Colorado, Ms. DeGette, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will put my full statement in the record. I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, I agree with my colleagues that this national broadband plan is a comprehensive and it is a forward-looking document, and I strongly share the goals. I want to raise just a couple of issues. Um, the first one is cities like Denver, which is my district, are often the first to get access to the first communications technologies, but access alone is not enough. What we have to remember as we go forward is that broadband also has to be affordable for low-income Amer Americans many of whom live in, in urban areas like my area and who have seen a real divide even though broadband is, is accessible in urban areas. The second issue I want to mention um, is, this, is, is the conflicts with existing uses that we are going to have to resolve. The broadband plan recommends allocating new spectrum to satisfy consumer demand for wireless data networks. And this could imp provide important benefits, but it also raises questions about how, if a significant transfer of spectrum to broadband is needed, we can ab accomplish the objective in the fairest way to existing spectrum uses. And so this is one of the questions that I hope that we can explore today. Uh, I, want, I want to just mention two other aspects of this plan that I am very pleased to see. The first one is the emphasis on health IT, which is going to be very important as we move forward with our new health care um, plan in this country, and which we have seen in my district with Denver Health, how much um, health IT can help with patient outcomes and efficiency. Secondly, I am very pleased to see some mention of expanding a national smart energy grid. I think a smart grid is going to be very important as we get independent from foreign oil and develop alternative energy. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. DeGette. The gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Boucher, for calling this uh, hearing. And thank you, Chairman Janikowski and the entire FCC for your work on the National Broadband Plan. Uh, you have given us a lot to consider, and there are many competing interests here. But I think our overarching goal must be to ensure that all Americans have access to broadband and the many benefits that the technology has to offer. Uh, and whether we live in big cities and urban areas or small rural towns, whether we're rich or poor, black or white, 
Uh, broadband holds so much promise. Uh, and it appears that the National Broadband Plan is a commitment to finally getting everyone on board and ensuring that we are a nation that is united by the most important technology since the invention of the telephone. So we must continue to modernize and innovate. Uh, I'd like to direct your attention to a couple of the proposals that are particularly important to the hardworking families in my state. Uh, first, the Universal Service Fund. Uh, Florida historically has paid a lot into it and hasn't gotten much back. Uh, so I'd like to hear how the broadband plan will correct uh, this past discrepancy. Do you have a commitment uh, to you, the use of spectrum for low-cost wireless service in communities where affordability remains a high barrier to broadband use? I know there are a lot of students and teachers and older folks who will need our help accessing this vital technology. Uh, the E-rate program should be robustly funded in order to ensure that schools and libraries have access to affordable broadband, including wireless connectivity. Uh, reform of the universal service fee must address these issues going forward. Second, a public safety network is indispensable to the functioning of our communities in an emergency. In, in Florida, hurricane season is just around the corner. Uh, that means our first responders will be on high alert should, should a big storm knock out uh, power and wreak havoc on our coastal communities. There's a lot of debate as to whether a dedicated block of spectrum would serve our first responders better than a shared network, and I'd like to hear more on this proposal. Overall, I'm supportive of the recommendations in the plan. I think it strikes a good balance between the incentives for innovation and incorporates practical mechanism to bridge the digital divide. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Ms. Castor. The gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Boucher, and thank you for holding this hearing so that we can go home better informed about the National Broadband Plan that was un unveiled by the FCC this week. Although the number of people connected to broadband in this country has gone from 8 million in 2000 to almost 200 million last year, far too many families are still not connected, and our world rankings are far too low. So while this plan is a solid blueprint, I do look forward to its implementations, closing the gaps and propelling us into the world leadership that we used to have before. It cannot be that because they are not connected, children can't do their homework, individuals can't access jobs, small businesses cannot buy or sell competitively, healthcare cannot reach everyone who needs it, and our public saf safety agencies cannot communicate well enough to protect us in an emergency. So this plan needs to ensure all of this while preserving and stimulating competitiveness and keeping costs affordable is quite a challenge you and all of us have ahead of us. We'll monitor with great interest the reforming of the Universal Service Fund and the E-rate, which we've had problems with in the Virgin Islands, as well as the freeing up and the auctioning of the spectrum. I have several concerns, one being, of course, that the territories be fully included. The rest of them I'll hope to get to in questions. And again, I want to commend you, Chairman Janikowski, and the other commissioners for the transparent, the open, the comprehensive process, and welcome all of you back to the subcommittee. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Weiner, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome uh, members of the Commission here and uh, express the gratitude of our committee for the work that went into this report. I want to associate myself with the remarks of Mr. Uh, Markey, and I do want to uh, just make a brief mention of my good friend, Mr. Shimkus, and his remarks. Uh, he's able to work up in a level of indignancy by 10 o'clock most of us can't muster in a whole day. And, uh, but I just, it is, it's important to note that having a conversation about broadband and our economy without looking at what, what we're doing and not doing and how we're slipping in relation to other states is, and other nations is just folly. You know, we have learned with our history with the internet and technology, it's a great job producer for us. It's a way we keep our competitive advantage. It would be akin to opening up a shoe store in a neighborhood and saying, I'm not going to look at any of the shoe stores in the neighborhood or in the neighboring town to find out what they're doing right or wrong. We have to think that way. And too often we, and it's a constitutional problem probably, that we think for a year to the next budget, to the next fiscal year, to the next appropriation bill. 
This document that was produced by the FCC takes that and turns it on its head and said, we have to look for the next generation, for the next 30 years, for the next 50 years. Admittedly, there are going to be some elements of this plan that are going to maybe create problems for one sector, maybe we're going to encourage other sectors, but that is exactly the type of thinking that we should want to do. We have to remember as we look at this, at this committee that we are looking for opportunities in this document to produce thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs. But we're not going to know exactly what they're going to look like. That's the way technology always operates. We are at our best at this body and in this subcommittee when we are laying the groundwork for innovation. The FCC has done it, and I want to thank you very much for setting us on this path. We are going to change a lot of words in this document. We're going to make some amendments to it, and we're going to find our own way, as a legislature often does. But as a blueprint, you've really scored, and I want to uh, express the gratitude of our country for your doing so. Thank you very much, Mr. Weiner. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space, is recognized for two minutes. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for uh, holding this hearing. And I'd like to thank Chairman Janikowski and the commissioners, along with their staff, for a lot of hard work. I know a lot of people have worked very hard around here lately, but I don't know that anyone has matched uh, the work that you and your teams have put in, so thank you. Uh, there are a lot of exciting and, I think, forward-thinking uh, aspects to the National Broadband Plan that you've prepared, and I'd like to highlight two areas of interest that I believe will benefit uh, the constituents that I represent back in Ohio. Uh, first, I'm uh, delighted to see that the plan proposes to transform the existing high-cost Universal Service Fund into the Connect America Fund that will support broadband networks. As stated in the testimony uh, before us this morning, 95% of Americans have access to broadband. And while that's uh, obviously very impressive, we still have a lot of work to do to cover that 5%, many of whom live in rural districts um, and have no options when it comes to broadband. Uh, many of those people are my constituents in southern Ohio. And uh, transitioning the high-cost fund to explicitly support broadband deployment to rural areas will be a tremendous help to the residents of Appalachian, Ohio. Uh, second, I'm encouraged to see the plan's recommendations on expanding the FCC's rural health care pilot program. In 2007, the Southern Ohio Health Care Network was successful in obtaining a pilot program grant to build a fiber optic network across uh, about 12 counties uh, to connect health care facilities. Uh, this has uh, paved the way for further broadband expansion in the region, and at present we're attempting to leverage this previous investment to deploy uh, broadband, actually middle mile fiber to 34 counties in southern Ohio that, again, uh, in many places have no options. Uh, success breeds success, and we must strengthen the rural health care pilot program by making it permanent, as the plan suggests, and by permitting for profit or for-profit entities serving vulnerable populations to be eligible. I stand ready to assist on this front, and in closing, I re reiterate my support for the goals addressed in the plan. And I very much look forward to working with the Commission, and my colleagues here in Congress, and industry partners to realize our nation's broadband potential. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Space. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for conducting this uh, hearing, and I welcome the uh, chairman of the FCC, Chairman uh, Jelenkowski, and the other commissioners. And uh, I want to join uh, with my uh, uh, colleagues in uh, congratulating you on a job well done. Uh, as members of Congress, we have seen far more than our fair share of plans uh, before and that have promised us the sun, the moon, the stars, and celestial bodies, bodies seen and unseen, known and unknown, but very few have been heralded so highly as this plan and its promises to enhance America's ability to improve the life choices of her people and to maintain her status as a global leader. While I may sound a bit skeptical about this plan, I'm really not. Much of it sounds good on paper and certainly makes for good uh, and polished sound bites. I understand the power of new communication technologies and the importance of innovation 
and leasing people and communities, increasing commercial efficiency and worker productivity, saving our precious energy resources, as well as the opportunity to heal the sick and safeguard public safety. The promise of widespread broadband access is of immense importance to our nation. The unique opportunity we presented with at this moment in history is unprecedented, and I want to ensure that Congress and the FCC steps up to the plate to uh, serve the best interests of the American people. Mr. Chairman, we will not get too many bites at this apple, and we don't execute this plan comprehensively and thoughtfully, we will miss out on a huge opportunity while also setting back the short-term and long-term technology needs and interests of the American people. I am therefore keenly interested in hearing uh, the Commission's perspective, especially on how the increased adoption of the broadband uh, plan can help to drive our economy out of its current doldrums by stimulating new jobs as well as opportunities for small business and uh, innovative entrepreneurs. The plan, as it current uh, reads, does not provide any recommendations, uh, however, on how small and minority businesses uh, can uh, stimulate uh, the American economy, and I think the plan should. Uh, I think, uh, to be frank, uh, commissioners, I think that this is a stunning omission. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman, with that I said, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Rush. The gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh, is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two points and one observation. Uh, first, the work that you're doing is absolutely critical to the future economic growth of this country. Uh, and what you've presented is a solid plan uh, that embraces competition, an acknowledgement if we're going to have competition, uh, we have to have access to the wires in the spectrum, and that we have to have universal service so it's going to uh, reach the most remote parts of our country. Tremendous. Uh, second, uh, you have done this on a bipartisan basis. Uh, and I got to tell you, that's uh, pretty unique around here, and I want to thank you for that. And this is my observation. Uh, you have taken a very difficult topic, presented a solid plan, and done it on a bipartisan basis, and it's so effective you may embarrass us into trying to do the same. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Welsh. The gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee, is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to note uh, the work you're doing is helpful uh, to uh, improve our health reform efforts, which are new and and uh, still building. I just want to point one instance where uh, our broadband policy can help the city of Republic Washington in Eastern Washington. You essentially have to turn off all the computers in Republic of Washington if you want to send an x-ray from Republic to have it read by a, a diagnostician in Seattle. That's unacceptable. This is part of our health re reform effort as well. I just want to make three quick points. First, I appreciate uh, the plan's effort to complete our white spaces uh, program which can free up spectrum, can allow the geniuses who are coming to create these new technologies. It's very exciting to get that done. Second, I'm pleased that you support essentially uh, uh, the direction and moving in our spectrum allocation provision. We've passed a bill in this committee to get that done and you've uh, joined us in that effort. We hope that'll actually be law before uh, we even get the next version of the report out. Third, uh, I'm I'm uh, pleased that you've got the public uh, safety block. You've got some ideas how to move forward. This is very frustrating to all of us to not to have an interoperable system at this late, late, late date with our law enforcement officers not having and firefighters not having systems. Got to get that job done. I think we're on the right track. Thank you. Mr. Ensley, thank you very much, and thanks to all members for being expeditious this morning. <laughs> Uh, well, you've heard from us, now we get to hear from you, and we would like to welcome the members of the Federal Communications Commission, the Chairman, Julius Jenankowski, Commissioner Michael Copps, Commissioner Robert McDowell, Commissioner Mendian Clyburn, and Commissioner Meredith Baker. Without objection, your prepared written statements will be made a part of the record. We would welcome your oral summaries and ask that you keep those to approximately five minutes so that we will have ample time to question you. Uh, Chairman Jenikowski, we welcome you and we'll be happy to hear your statement. Thank you, Chairman Boucher. 
Ranking Member Stearns, members of the committee, thank you all for the chance to testify in the National Broadband Plan. The plan addresses the opportunities and challenges of broadband high-speed internet in a way that reflects a strong conviction that as our nation rebuilds Rick. its economy, Rick. broadband can and must serve as a foundation for long-term economic growth. Chairman Janikowski, if I could get you to pull that microphone just a little bit closer, we can hear you. How is that? Better. That's much better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a foundation, broadband, for long-term economic growth, ongoing investment, and enduring job creation. Multiple studies tell us the same thing. Even modest increases in broadband adoption can yield hundreds of thousands of new jobs. A broad array of people throughout the ecosystem, investors, entrepreneurs, business leaders, labor leaders, consumer advocates, and others, agree that if the U.S. has world-leading broadband networks, we'll see a powerful new wave of innovation and business and job creation here at home. The title of one recent op-ed written by the CEO of a major American technology company said it well, fix the bridges, but don't forget broadband. Now we have real work to do to seize the opportunities of broadband. The status quo is not good enough. Notwithstanding the many positive and even exciting developments in the U.S. around wired and wireless broadband, our country is not where it should be or needs to be to maintain our global competitiveness in this rapidly changing world. First, the U.S. is lagging globally, as several studies show, as low as 17th in one broadband survey, and 40th out of 40 among countries surveyed in the rate of change of innovative capacity. That tells us that other countries are improving faster than the U.S. Second, certain communities within the U.S. are lagging. Rural Americans, low-income Americans, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, seniors, tribal communities, Americans with disabilities, for these groups, adoption rates are much lower than the 65% national average, which is itself much lower than other countries, and much lower than what we would tolerate for vital infrastructure like electricity or telephones. Altogether, 93 million Americans are not connected to broadband at home, including 13 million children, and 14 million Americans do not have access to broadband where they live, even if they want it. That's too many. Third, the costs of digital exclusion grow higher every day. Several years ago, not having broadband could have been thought by some to be simply an inconvenience. Now broadband access and digital literacy are essential to participation in our economy and our democracy. As I believe Congress anticipated when it directed the FCC to prepare a national broadband plan, the plan the FCC has submitted is a plan for action and a call to action that these times require. The terrific FCC staff and broadband team have produced a plan that is as strong as it is non-ideological and nonpartisan. It was the outcome of an extraordinary process that has been unprecedented in so many respects, unprecedented in its openness and transparency, in the breadth and depth of public participation, in its professionalism, and in its focus on data and analytical rigor. The plan sets ambitious goals for the country, including access for every American to robust and affordable broadband service and the skills to subscribe, broadband speed of at least one gigabit to at least one library, school, or other public anchor institution in every community, affordable 100 megabits per second to 100 million households, world-leading mobile innovation with the fastest and most extensive wireless networks of any nation, access for every first responder to a nationwide interoperable broadband public safety network. In addition to these and other goals, the plan lays out a robust, sensible, and efficient roadmap for achieving them. Among other things, it proposes a once-in-a-generation transformation of the Universal Service Fund from yesterday's technology to tomorrow's, it proposes recovering and unleashing licensed and unlicensed spectrum so that we can head off the looming spectrum crisis and lead the world in mobile. It proposes ways to cut red tape, lower the cost of private investment, and accelerate deployment of wired and wireless networks. It proposes initiatives to foster vibrant competition and empower consumers. It proposes a roadmap to tackle vital inclusion challenges so that everyone everywhere can enjoy the benefits of broadband and it proposes ways in which broadband can be deployed to help solve many of our nation's challenges, including education, healthcare, energy, and public safety. I'm heartened that a broad array of companies, as well as nonprofits, consumer, and public interest groups, have voiced strong support for the plan. If I may read uh, what uh, uh, John Chambers, CEO of Cisco, wrote in Business Week, the vital communication systems that make our economy work and serve as a platform for business innovation and social interactions are second class. <coughs> Sadly, many of us have accepted that. It's time to overcome our broadband complacency. The national broadband plan sent to Congress by the FCC is critical to our economic and national security. Without a plan, we simply cannot compete. I believe the plan will deliver extremely significant economic and fiscal benefits over time, 
as broadband is harnessed for job creation and new investment. I believe, I believe the, van is, the plan is fiscally prudent, respecting the primacy of private investment and identifying opportunities for billions of dollars in spectrum auctions. As we move forward, I look forward to working with members of the committee on the broadband plan and on all ideas to unleash the power of broadband, a technology with the greatest potential since the advent of electricity to advance our economic and social well-being to the benefit of all Americans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Janikowski. Commissioner Cobbs. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, members of the subcommittee for having us up here today to discuss the National Broadband Plan. This is something, as many of you know, that has been near and dear to me for the almost nine years that I have been at the Commission. I had long lamented our nation's lack of a broadband strategy in a competitive world where other nations were leaving us in their competitive, uh, in the digital dust. Uh, now that's changed. We've got a roadmap. We've set our compass on due north. We know where we want to go and we're setting off down that road. At last, we begin to walk the broadband walk. We head down this road not because broadband is some technophile's dream or some cool new tool, but because of the dawning realization that high-value broadband is the great enabler of our time. This technology infrastructure intersects with just about every great challenge confronting our country today. Jobs, business growth, education, energy, the environment, international competitiveness, health care, overcoming disabilities, opening doors of equal opportunity, news and information, and our democratic dialogue. There is no solution to any of these challenges that does not have a broadband component to it. Now we understand. So it was music to my ears when Congress called for the development of a national broadband plan. Under the visionary leadership of Chairman Janikowski and with the hard work of an impressive FCC team, and in the most open and transparent process I have witnessed at the Commission, we now have a plan with clear objectives and a considered strategy aimed at ensuring that everyone in this country has equal opportunity in this new digital age, no matter who they are, where they live, or the particular circumstances of their individual lives. Foremost among our charges is digital inclusion. Every one of our citizens must have access to this enabling technology in order to participate fully in 21st century life. You won't get a job without it. You won't be safe without it. You can't be well educated without it. You cannot be an engaged citizen without it. So surely America cannot afford to have any digital divides between haves and have-nots, between those living in big cities and those in rural areas or tribal lands, between the able-bodied and people with disabilities. Broadband must leave no American behind, including the original Americans, Native Americans. I encourage the broadband team to make sure this plan works for Indian country, and I am pleased with the recommendations that have been delivered. I also wanted to ensure that the plan was aimed at providing full accessibility to persons with disabilities. These are folks who ask nothing more than an equal shot at being fully productive citizens, and broadband can make that so much more achievable if we get it to them. My written testimony elaborates on these two points. Let me also very quickly say how pleased I am that the plan addresses the need for better research and development efforts in our society and, of course, pleased about the public safety plan, which we will talk about. I want to spend my last couple of minutes on the perhaps less tangible but no less important dimensions of broadband. As our information infrastructure begins to migrate online, we become increasingly dependent upon broadband for news and information, for our civic engagement, for our democratic dialogue. America's future town square will be paved with broadband bricks. We need to make sure it is available to all and open to all. With high-speed internet, those who are connected can have the world at their fingertips. For the unconnected, it's beyond their reach. An increase of technology does not by itself, however, guarantee a more informed citizenry. Neither does just hooking everybody up to broadband. A well-connected nation does not equate to a well-informed nation without significant effort. Put another way, a nation connected but not informed or civically engaged is about as useful to democracy as a plugged-in lamp with no light bulb. I believe that our country's democratic dialogue will suffer if the same harms that have been inflicted upon traditional media are allowed to undercut the potential of new media in the digital age. Time happily spares you my extended remarks on this subject. But we all know journalism is in trouble, journalism is a crossroads, and we'd better do something about how the American people are going to receive the news and information they need in a world where the town square is going broadband 
and where a critically important public interest has somehow to be safeguarded. Any viable solutions will have to address both traditional media and online media. And I am pleased that the National Broadband Plan recognizes the need to come to terms with the news and information implications of the digital transition. I look forward to working on this with the members of this subcommittee. Each of the commissioners would have, I am certain, some variations on the plan that has been presented. In matters involving the reclamation of spectrum, for example, I will be especially vigilant that nothing we do decreases the already scarce diversity we have in programming or in media ownership. Every local voice that disappears runs against the grain of the public interest. Regarding competition in our telecommunications industries, it will take great vigilance to ensure that consumers in our present consolidated environment can have more access to competitive providers. This may require some very tough decisions, but I believe the plan provides ample opportunity for us to tackle and resolve such problems as we proceed. My final comment is on an issue I try to highlight every time I come before you. It is the need to facilitate the work of the commissioners by modifying the closed meeting rule that prohibits more than two of us ever talking together and sharing our experiences about the great issues before the commission. My experience has shown me that this has had pernicious and unintended consequences, stifling collaborative discussions among colleagues, delaying timely decision making by the agency, and shortchanging the public interest. I note that Representatives Stupak, Eshoo, and Doyle have introduced legislation to correct this. I believe the legislation they have introduced would constitute as major a reform of the Commission procedures as any that I can contemplate. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your comments, your guidance, and your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner Copps. Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Stearns and all members of the committee. It really truly is a privilege to be before you today. The broadband plan offered up last week by the Office of Broadband Initiative does represent a tremendous amount of hard work and thoughtfulness. However, it was not put to a commission vote and contains no rules. And that's because the plan represents the beginning of a process and not the end of one. While we may disagree at times on the best paths to follow during our upcoming journey, we can all agree on at least the primary destination, a country that offers faster broadband access to more Americans at affordable prices. Before going further, however, all policymakers involved should pledge to do no harm. Precisely because the FCC classified broadband services as less regulated information services, we have seen the deployment and adoption of broadband technologies flourish. As the plan itself asserts, the number of Americans who have broadband at home has grown from 8 million in the year 2000 to nearly 200 million last year. In fact, today, out of 114 million households, only 7 million lack access to broadband. Some form of broadband is available to roughly 95% of Americans, while over two-thirds have actually subscribed. One especially bright gem in America's economy is the phenomenal growth in wireless broadband adoption. Mobile broadband was virtually unheard of in the year 2000. By the end of last year, however, an estimated 100 million Americans subscribe to wireless broadband technologies. We lead the world in 3G build-out and adoption. Furthermore, America is home to more wireless companies than any other country. More than half of all Americans have a choice of five wireless providers. 94 percent have a choice of four. Not only has investment and innovation been dynamic in the telecom core of the Internet environment, but economic activity at the edge of networks has been nothing short of explosive as well. For instance, last year, Americans again led the world by downloading over 1.1 billion applications onto their mobile devices. Not only does the United States have one third of the world's market share of mobile apps, but the American mobile app market has grown over 500% since the year 2007. In fact, some researchers estimate that annual domestic mobile app downloads will reach nearly 7 billion by the year 2014. The Internet is an environment that is growing and evolving faster than any individual, company, or government can measure. The net operates in an open and free marketplace where innovation and investment are thriving. In fact, some estimate that private sector investment in broadband infrastructure exceeded $60 billion last year alone. Any policies 
the government adopts should nurture and strengthen these trends and not undermine them. For instance, cable modem services alone are available to 92 percent of American households merely by upgrading cable networks with the DOCSIS 3.0 system, which is expected to happen over the next few years anyway, over 104 Ameri million American homes will have access to speeds of up to 100 megs. Unless the government provides disincentives to investments, the broadband plan's goal of reaching 100 million households with 100 meg services should be attained well before the year 2020, 2020 if we allow current trends to continue. In that spirit, I question calls for further regulating one of the brightest spots of the American economy. Chapter 17 of the plan opens the door to classifying broadband services as old-fashioned, monopoly-era, circuit-switched, voice telephone services under Title II of the Communications Act of 1934. Broadband has flourished because of the absence of such regulations. And let me clear up a persistent myth. Broadband has never been, never been regulated under Title II. Not only would such a classification likely fail on appeal, I also don't see how foisting regulations first devised in the 19th century would help a competitive 21st century marketplace continue to thrive. The plan does contain ideas that are worth exploring further, however. For instance, bringing more spectrum to market, market should continue to be a priority for the Commission, as it has been for the past several years. We should place a special emphasis on frequencies that are lying fallow or are underused, particularly spectrum held by the government. When auctioned, spectrum should remain unencumbered by regulation. At the same time, however, the Commission should encourage more efficient use of the airwaves, in addition to rapid build-out. The need to use spectrum efficiently is inevitable, so we should work to stay ahead of the spectral efficiency curve. Additionally, the plan calls for comprehensive reform of the universal service subsidy rules. This system is broken, plain, and simple. Our first priority, however, should be to contain costs. The contribution factor, a tax of sorts, which is directly paid by consumers, has ballooned from 5.53% in 1998 to over 15% today. This trend hurts American consumers and is unsustainable. In its current condition, the Universal Service Fund cannot support additional obligations. I've outlined many other ideas in my written statement. In the meantime, I look forward to working with Congress and my Commission colleagues to adopt policies that allow investment, innovation, job growth, competition, and adoption in the broadband market to continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner McDowell. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Stearns, and members of the subcommittee. Yes, turn on the mic. Yeah, your microphone, please. Yeah. That might help. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Stearns, and members of the subcommittee. It is an honor and a privilege to appear before you today to discuss the National Broadband Plan. Over the past nine months, the FCC undertook the mammoth task of developing a blueprint for this nation that aims to bolster our standing as a world leader in technology, business, and inclusion. Under Chairman Janikowski's leadership, this process was conducted in an unprecedented, open, and transparent manner in order to ensure that we maximized opportunity for public input. There are three issues in particular that I wanted to touch on today. In my view, each of these warrants our utmost and immediate attention. One, fostering the development of a nationwide interoperable public safety network. Two, ensuring an environment conducive to universal broadband adoption. And three, cultivating vibrant competition in the broadband marketplace. Developing a nationwide interoperable public safety network is no easy task. This fact, however, is no excuse for where we stand today. It is inconceivable that, in the almost nine years since the tragic events of September 11, 2001, we still have not meaningfully addressed this critical need. The National Broadband Plan attempts to meet this challenge. It offers concrete steps for a nationwide public safety wireless broadband network that will provide needed functionality and interoperability for the public safety community. The recommendations for the Emergency Response Interoperability Center and congressional funding for the network in particular address two of the most fundamental building blocks necessary to make this network a reality. 
Moreover, the plan sets forth a rigorous program to make sure we get the details right, and the Commission has already put these ideas in motion by hosting a technical panel to review the finer points of the proposed network. Another indispensable part of the plan concerns broadband adoption. Approximately one-third of Americans have not adopted broadband at home. While some view this percentage as a success, there are reasons to be concerned. High-speed internet is the gateway to opportunity and is fast becoming a requirement for meaningful citizenship. If you want to apply for a job, get more information on health-related issues, take classes that are unavailable in your town, unlock economic opportunities, or before long, be able to obtain government services, you must have direct high-speed access to the internet. If we steamroll ahead without our fellow Americans joining us online, we will merely be reinforcing an underclass that will weigh heavily on our progress as a nation. The plan also offers a critical recommendation with respect to the high cost of broadband. Specifically, the plan recommends wholesale reform of the Universal Service Fund to both make it more efficient and enable it to directly support broadband service. This process requires assessing and adjusting nearly every aspect of the current USF support methods, as well as the intercarrier compensation system. The third element central to a successful broadband strategy is competition. Competition is the lifeblood of investment, innovation, and affordable prices. Without it, industry has little reason to upgrade its facilities and improve its services. A cable industry executive recently noticed as much as such, informing investors that there is simply no need for the company to roll out the faster internet speeds available today in areas where it does not have competition from another high-speed provider. Thus, only in areas where Americans are lucky enough to have more than one provider with truly high-speed capability will providers like this one have any economic incentive to offer better service. The same holds true for prices. There is little question that where there is limited or no competition, consumers pay higher prices for broadband. Indeed, just recently we saw a new spike in prices levied by providers on the lowest tiers of service. When such across-the-board increases occur, our role as stewards of the public interest requires us to examine the market carefully and take appropriate action where necessary. In closing, I would like to express my gratitude to my colleagues and my enthusiasm for working with them to address the challenges ahead. I also want to recognize the important work of the committee and look forward to engaging constructively with you in the weeks and months ahead. The American people rely on us to work cooperatively to ensure that we implement a national broadband plan that is good for consumers and that helps drive our economy. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Commissioner Clyburn. Commissioner Baker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Stearns, and members of the sub subcommittee. Um, good morning or almost afternoon now. It's really a privilege to appear before you today. I look forward to working with you as we consider the many important issues that have been raised in the National Broadband Plan. I would like to share just a few remarks with you here this morning, hitting many of the topics that my companions have, as you have also. As I understand, my full statement will be entered into the record. So broadband in America is a success story. Under a light touch, targeted regulatory regime in both the Clinton and the Bush administrations, we have gone from a narrow band dial-up world to a multi-platform broadband world by crafting a regulatory framework that promotes facilities-based competition, not prescriptive government requirements. Private industry from every communication platform has responded to this consistent framework with substantial network investment and deployment to the great benefit of consumers. This has resulted in broadband availability to 95% of Americans and healthy competition from rival providers. Indeed, there are only 7 million households where market forces have yet to yield a wired broadband provider. Yet there's more work to be done, and I'm pleased to be here talking about the National Broadband Plan. Turning to the National Broadband Plan itself, 
There are places where I would have made different recommendations and suggestions, but I am grateful to the Commission's broadband team for its hard work and find that significant parts of the plan deserve careful consideration. I would like to say a few words about three key priorities from the plan today. First, as I have said since I arrived at the FCC, one area for prompt government action is spectrum policy. One of the plan's most important recommendations is the call for a more comprehensive, long-term approach to spectrum management. The continued success of state-of-the-art mobile broadband depends on our ability to align our spectrum policies with the changing needs of consumers and industry. Other nations, like Germany and Japan, are already planning significant additional blocks of spectrum to be auctioned for mobile broadband. The U.S. must act similarly to lay the foundation for the next generation of mobile innovation, machine-to-machine -machine communications, mobile health, and a meaningful alternative to fixed broadband. I hope our policies in this area will be guided by three overarching objectives, facilitating efficient use of spectrum, identifying and reallocating additional spectrum, and encouraging investment and innovation in wireless networks and technologies. The second policy area is comprehensive universal service fund and intercarrier compensation reform targeted to broadband investment in unserved areas. We need to update our funding, re our funding mechanisms to reflect a broadband world, and we must do so in a manner that ensures accountability and efficiency. We need to do this manner in a manner that does not expand the size of the $9 billion fund. Consumers pay for this. The universal service contribution factor for next quarter will be the largest ever, 15.3%. This is real money, a $6 tax on a $40 phone bill. Third, nationwide public safety interoperability must be a top priority. I believe the plan's recommendations are an appropriate place for us to start, focusing on the sufficiency of first responder funding and available spectrum resources. The need for interoperability was highlighted in the 9-11 report and devastatingly illustrated in the aftermath of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. We must move forward expeditiously to provide the communications tools our, first na our nation's first responders deserve. As we consider all of the plan's recommendations, our broadband policy should be focused on these efforts directly tied to promoting adoption, deployment, and facilities-based competition. We should build upon the strong regulatory foundation that we have before us, harnessing private investment, encouraging entrepreneurs and inventors to drive better broadband to more Americans. I'm concerned that some of the proposals referenced in the plan have the Commission chart a more radical path, changing our market-based regulatory framework mid-course in a manner that could diminish our much-needed emphasis on adoption and chill the private investment we need for our broadband infrastructure. We must, in particular, resist efforts to adopt rules in the network neutrality proceeding that would dictate how networks are managed and operated. I have attended two technical workshops and reviewed the record on net neutrality, and I have yet to see any evidence of a systematic problem that needs to be addressed today. We also should reject calls to regulate the Internet under Monopoly-era Title II rules and rebuff unbundling proposals that selectively forget our long and checkered history with government-manufactured competition. Lastly, I am hopeful we avoid one-size-fits-all approaches to broadband. This is particularly true with respect to affordability, relevancy, and literacy adoption hurdles facing a third of Americans today. Each one of them has its own importance. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner Baker, and thanks to each of the commissioners and the chairman for your thoughtful comments to us today. We appreciate your sharing some of the rationale you've had in developing this comprehensive and very well-constructed plan. Uh, Commissioner Jenikowski, I was um, very pleased to note the ambitious deadlines that you've set forth in the plan for, at long last, achieving the competitive availability of set-top boxes. Um, I think that if consumers could shop for set-top boxes in the store and choose boxes that have varied functionality, a variety of different functions available from different manufacturers, all of which are compatible with every cable system and every satellite system for delivering multi-channel video. Uh, we would see tremendous innovation 
in the market for the origination of these devices, and I think we would soon see devices on store shelves that would have functionality well beyond the typical set-top box you buy from the cable company or the satellite company today. So I commend you for setting forth these ambitious deadlines. This is not a new issue. In, in fact, it's 15 years old. In the 96 Communications Act, we directed the Commission to move forward with a rulemaking in order to assure the competitive availability of these set-top boxes. And uh, still today, consumers can't go to the store and shop for a variety of different set-top boxes. So uh, I'm glad to see the recommendation. I would ask you uh, if you agree with me that rather than putting forth a mere notice of inquiry and continuing for a much longer period of time the discussion about this, it's now time to move, move to a notice of proposed rulemaking. I think it is. I hope you would agree, and I would ask for your response. Well, first of all, thank you for raising that topic. It's an important one for the And if you could pull the mic a bit closer, all right. we can hear you that better. You, uh, that you mentioned Congress did uh, require competition in this area. Uh, we've seen much less competition and innovation than we could. The reason that it's in the broadband plan is that the team realized during its work that while computers are only in about 76 percent of homes, uh, TVs are in almost 100 percent of homes. And so if we can unleash uh, this particular market, uh, that can help accelerate our broadband goals. Uh, with respect to the exact process, I'd be happy to work with you. I think that it's the intention to move as expeditiously uh, as possible. Uh, we haven't made a final decision on the, uh, the process to use, but I'd be happy to have one. Well, th thank you very much. I would encourage you to give very serious favorable consideration to going right to a rulemaking. We've been discussing this for 15 years. That's, that's time enough. Uh, secondly, you appear to be recommending a role for local governments, municipalities across the country in helping to deploy broadband. I, I share that aspiration. In fact, in past con Congresses, I've introduced legislation that would free local governments to offer broadband, particularly where there are gaps and, for whatever reason, the commercial providers have not offered an array of uh, competitive services for broadband. Uh, does the mention of this in your broadband plan imply support for legislation that would remove the roadblocks that various states have erected to their municipalities offering broadband, and would you recommend that we adopt legislation effectively preempting those roadblocks and freeing communities nationwide in order to deploy broadband services? Well, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, not comment on specific legislation, although we'd be happy to be a resource uh, to you on that. Um, uh, the topic, the goal of unleashing local governments to experiment and innovate around broadband access uh, seems to me a highly desirable goal, and I'd be pleased to work with you on the best path to, uh, to, to encourage the kind of local experimentation that could be very oh, beneficial. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very diplomatic answers you're providing the, this morning. <laughs> uh, let me uh, use the balance of my time to talk a bit about D-Block. Uh, I, I think you um, are on the right track in recommending that the D-Block of the 700 megahertz spectrum, uh, the only part of the 700 megahertz still in government hands, uh, be auctioned, and, and auctioned essentially without the kinds of onerous conditions that attached to the D-Block auction several years ago that caused that auction to fail. Uh, so I, I heartily endorse your idea of auctioning without those kinds of conditions. Uh, I have two questions. First of all, uh, would you need legislation in order to devote the proceeds to that auction in some significant part uh, or perhaps totally um, to the build out of equipment for fire police and rescue nationwide? I believe we would. Uh, I agree. And uh, we will certainly uh, work. I'm working now with Chairman Waxman to structure a bill that would uh, provide that clear authority. The second question I have uh, relates um, to um, your proposal that the winners uh, in the D block auction. Uh, and also the holders of all 700 megahertz spectrum. That would include the cellular companies that prevailed in previous 700 megahertz auctions. Provide roaming access to first responders at reasonable rates. And also give priority access to first responders at times 
when uh, the public safety spectrum is either fully uh, occupied or for other reasons unavailable. Uh, now, that recommendation on its face may give pause to some who would consider taking part in an auction because it needs better definition. So I, I suppose my direct question to you is, uh, to how does that requirement, were it to be a part of your auction rules, relate to the existing priority, a wireless priority system that is in place today for federal personnel? Uh, would it be a simple extension of that, which might prove to be not so onerous, or would it be something beyond that that might prove to be more onerous? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the goal is to adopt a set of rules that would not be onerous and that would allow us finally to move forward and deliver on the 9-11 Commission recommendations. Uh, uh, it'll be the subject of the rulemaking. We'll have plenty of opportunity for input, but I'm very pleased that uh, uh, four members on a bipartisan basis of the 9-11 Commission have looked at our plan and said this is a very sensible way to go. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we appreciate your being here and sharing these thoughts with us. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, and I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record the response that uh, Chairman Janikowski sent to me about the uh, creation of this plan. Without objection. Uh, I notice, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, you indicated you spent about $20 million to develop this plan. I think that works out about 50000 a page or more. Uh, it took you about a year, I think, to develop this plan, so uh, in effect it's $50,000 a day. Um, I think when we uh, developed the 1996 uh, telecommunication bill, uh, we didn't have a plan in there, and then later on uh, there was some talk about it, and your former chairman, uh, Kennard, said that uh, in 1999, let me read his speech, that uh, the fertile fields of innovation across the communication sector and around the country are blooming because from the get-go we have taken a deregulatory competitive approach to our communication structure, especially the Internet. So I think with those statements, uh, and this obviously uh, a predecessor of yours, do you agree with his statements? Uh, I agree. Yes, I do. And they remain valid today? Uh, yes, I, I would say uh, uh, um, making sure that we have policies that unleash investment, that encourage innovation. Policies of the government, you mean? Well, as you know, as you know in this area, um, whether it's Spectrum, whether it's Universal Service Fund, um, uh, uh, there are policies that the government needs to be involved in, is involved with. The question for us is, what kind of climate, what kind of policies can we make sure we have that promote investment, that promote innovation, that protect and empower consumers, and that promote competition? That's how I look at it. Okay. Mr. McDowell, um, Mr. Walsh has indicated this is a, uh, a bipartisan plan, and I, and I think you pointed out uh, no one voted on it. It's true that you and Ms. Baker didn't vote on this bill. Is that correct? That's correct. And during the process this year that was developed and they spent $20 million, were you ever consulted during the year, you or your staff? Were you called up and let in to participate in the development of this plan? Absolutely. Okay. And you were, Ms. Baker, too? Uh, when did you get a chance to see the final plan? We saw the final uh, text, or the final draft, uh, starting about 21 days uh, before uh, the March 18th uh, meeting, so uh, late February. Late February. The actual did, text. Did you think it might be helpful that you would saw it earlier? Or, I mean, how do you feel about your participation? You know, I think there's actually a benefit to the fact that there was not a vote in that. I think it allowed uh, the broadband plan team to have the liberty to put in there uh, what they saw fit to put in there. Uh, okay. So I, I think that was actually a, a net positive. Obviously, there are things I agree with and things I disagree with, as I think all of us uh, probably can uh, say that. So I think it was a net positive. We did not have the vote and uh, allowed them. Uh, certainly, uh, I originally, uh, a year ago, long before Chairman Janikowski was even nominated, had uh, said that a plan like this should be put out for public comment, but the Commission only had a year to do it, so I understand there were time constraints as well. Okay. Uh, Mr. Je uh, Chairman Janikowski, uh, the broadband plan recommends appropriating an additional $9 billion to convert the already $8 billion a year universal service fund for broadband. Now, if we have $7.2 billion uh, in the stimulus package uh, for broadband uh, was appropriately spent, uh, why do we need an additional $9 billion? Right. Mr. Stearns, if I could, uh, sorry, that's not exactly what the plan says. First, on universal okay. service fund, the plan uh, outlines a roadmap for the FCC to cut and cap existing spend for telephone service 
and transition that funding to broadband without increasing the growth of the fund so that over a 10-year period, the transition from uh, the old USF to the new USF can happen without any additional funding. The plan goes on to say that if Congress thought it desirable to accelerate that transition, to have that transition happen faster than 10 years, it would cost several billion dollars over a few years to do that. And that is something that, as part of the development of the plan, uh, it was thought should be presented for consideration. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Commissioner McDowell, Assistant Secretary of State uh, Vermeer said that net neutrality could be employed as a pretext or as an excuse for undertaking public policy activities that we would disagree with pretty fundamentally. Um, just days earlier, uh, uh, the president of Venezuela called for regulation of the Internet while demanding authorities crack down on a news website that was critical of him. The Internet can't be something free when, so when anything can be done and said. No every, no, every country has to impose its rules and regulation, is, is what he said. Uh, how do we hold other countries to higher standards if we ourselves are beginning to, to get involved with regulation? Or perhaps uh, you might just comment on some of the, uh, the comments that the Assistant Secretary of State said as well as uh, what the President of Venezuela said. Well, I'll let uh, Ambassador Bevere uh, speak for himself, uh, but I have uh, for quite some time now expressed uh, similar concerns that uh, as governments uh, encroach more into the area of network management of the Internet, um, that we uh, really start to lose the moral high ground. What appears to be reasonable to us may not uh, appear reasonable to other countries and vice versa. Uh, actually, as uh, Commissioner Baker said, since the clinton Gore administration, it's been the policy of the U.S. government that network management issues and the governance of the Internet should be left to non-governmental bodies, such as the Internet Engineering Task Force and others. Uh, and uh, this has worked quite well. What, what has really made the uh, Internet so robust and, and growth there so explosive is, in effect, it is somewhat lawless, uh, that it is uh, uh, positively uh, chaotic in a positive and constructive way. And I think we do need to be very cautious uh, before we uh, venture into this area further. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Stearns. The Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin my questions, I'd like to correct an assertion made by Commissioner McDowell that broadband has never been regulated under Title II. DSL broadband was a Title II service until August 2005 when the Commission moved it uh, to Title I. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about the plan's recommendations regarding the creation of a nationwide interoperable broadband network for public safety. I know that all parties agree that the problem of interoperability needs to be resolved, but it seems like there is a strong disagreement regarding what we should do with the D block. Uh, Chairman Janikowski, in your February 25, 2010 remarks introducing the public safety recommendations in the plan, you emphasized that you directed FCC staff to begin anew, not take anything for granted, be data-driven and creative, and come up with the best policy recommendations to achieve success. Do the recommendations in the plan reflect that direction? Yes, they do. Uh, Admiral Jamie Barnett, uh, an extraordinary public servant, has led up our efforts to do this. That was the charge to him, uh, and he has been committed with his team on developing a framework for finally delivering on the 9-11 Commission recommendations. Was the staff free to recommend reallocation of the D block if that was the best plan for public safety? Yes. And do you agree with the conclusion that 10 megahertz of dedicated broadband spectrum in combination with access to additional commercial spectrum is enough to ensure public safety interoperability at this time? Uh, and what about the future? Yeah, I, I agree with the very deeply thought through plan that was put together by the public safety team. In the future, there may be additional needs for spectrum. We need to recover more spectrum for a variety of purposes, and in the future, we may need more uh, spectrum for public safety, and it should be part of our strategic planning process over time. Is it uh, correct to say that the FCC's engineers and technical experts fully analyze whether 10, 10 megahertz of spectrum dedicated to broadband would yield adequate spectrum capacity, and did they do their due diligence on this question? Yes, I believe they did. I'd like to ask uh, Commissioner Copps, McDowell, Baker, and Clyburn, is the approach outlined in the plan the best way to achieve interoperability in your view? Uh, do each of you support the recommendation that the DBOC be auctioned for primarily commercial purposes? 
I support this uh, plan. When I was acting chairman, one of the things I, I did was direct our staff to go back to a basic, put all the options on the table for the incoming chairman so we could really start uh, and look at all options. As Commissioner Clyburn pointed out, we're eight years beyond 9-11 uh, now. We've got to get moving. This is a far more uh, solidly grounded plan, a far more thought out plan. I'm not saying it's the only plan, and I'm not saying all the questions are answered right this second, but I think this is the one to proceed on if it meets the, uh, the approval of the Congress, because Congress has a role here, too. Thank but you. I am happy we have, uh, uh, under the Chairman's leadership, uh, moved the ball this far down the field. I think we have a unified plan here, and we should. Well, let me ask your colleagues, because maybe they can give me a yes or no answer, because the time is running out. Do, do you support the recommendation to be, au be auctioned for uh, primarily commercial purposes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very quickly, uh, trend, the transmission component uh, that uh, broadband rides on has been regulated under Title II, but broadband services have never been uh, regulated under Title II. I'll be happy if, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, you'll allow me to uh, file something supplemental for the committee outlining the history of that. In any case, uh, the D block, I think, uh, primarily should serve as uh, uh, commercial services and should be auctioned off accordingly. Okay. But keep in mind that Congress in 1997, well before 2001, uh, September 11th, um, set aside 24 megahertz of the 700 megahertz block. That is sitting there. That is wonderful spectrum that should be used for something other than narrowband voice. Public safety has it at, at its disposal about 97 megahertz total uh, of spectrum of various kinds, uh, not all uh, apples. Some are apples and oranges. But uh, so, so you agree. There. So you agree with this? It should be auctioned off commercially. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn? I, I believe that the auction model is comprehensive and pragmatic. Yes. Thank you. And Commissioner Baker? On balance, I agree with the plan. Okay. Uh, the plan recommends that Congress come up with very significant amounts of money to fund the construction and maintenance of the proposed network. Chairman Janikowski, does the $6.5 billion estimated for construction of the network account for, account for state matching funds? And if the federal government were to contribute to the construction of this network, would it be reasonable to require states to pay a share of the costs associated with the construction? Well, Mr. Chairman, if I could, we'd be happy to supply you the underlying work behind the $6 billion. Okay. I'm not sure the answer to your question. I will say one thing, if I could. Um, to move forward on this now while commercial 4G networks are being built out is the least expensive way to make sure that we build a public safety network. If we wait, it, the price will only go up. Okay, thank you very much. I uh, look forward to uh, moving on a bipartisan basis to meet the needs of the public safety community. And I look forward to working with the FCC toward that goal. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to put in the record a press uh, comment by the FCC dated August 5, 2005, uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Title I, Title II issue. Without objection. Thank you. The uh, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And again, uh, welcome, Commissioners. Uh, a number of us have a, a good number of questions. <clears throat> uh, Chairman Janikowski, welcome again. Uh, first question for me is uh, as it relates to the broadcast spectrum. As you know, we're, we're uh, working on legislation here. Uh, I, I think one of the things that we want to make sure is that you all do not force the broadcasters uh, to give away or, or auction uh, some of that spectrum. Is we on the same page on that? I think so. Let me. The, the need here is urgent for the country. Mobile broadband is as important a platform for job creation, innovation for, the, uh, for decades to come. We have the opportunity to lead the world, but not if we don't have enough spectrum. What our team has done is develop a win-win-win plan for mobile broadband, for broadcasters, for the public uh, that I'd be happy to discuss with you further, but that I think should work for everyone, and it's based on uh, voluntary uh, actions by broadcasters and an incentive auction that we hope Congress will authorize. I like those words. Uh, 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 Mr. McDowell, uh, we all, as we, as we look to increase broadband speeds, as, as I look at Chapter 4 uh, in this book, uh, it seems to me that if, we, if there were a fiber unbundling requirement, uh, th uh, th it, would, it would hurt us dramatically as we try to deploy uh, fiber networks in areas that do not have the broadband access today. Uh, I think you're in agreement on that. I wonder if you want, might want to comment. In the next couple of years, uh, if we were to do that today, over the next couple of years, I think we would see a tremendous amount of litigation. There are two uh, 
decisions by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, USTA 1 and USTA 2, uh, that speak directly uh, to these uh, issues. And uh, it's really, at this point, settled law, uh, as uh, Commissioner Baker was saying. Uh, and uh, I, I think we would be, be exposing ourselves to a tremendous amount of litigation and an ultimate loss if we try to impose unbundling regulations on fiber that had been laid uh, subsequent to those court cases, especially. And Chairman Janikowski, I noted that Blair Levin, the executive director of your broadband initiative, dismissed unbundling in a December 21st, 09 uh, interview as, quote, not very productive. Uh, the reason that he explained is that the Commission is not that terribly, and this is again in quotes, not that terribly interested in moving towards things which will freeze capital investment and have long, complicated court battles along the lines of what Mr. McDowell uh, indicated. More importantly, he observed these suggestions, quote, fail to look at what's really going on in the market. What are your thoughts as it relates to your executive director? Is he on the, good ground? Uh, the goal good. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the goals of promoting investment innovation in the sector uh, are our highest <clears throat> goals. Promoting competition is one of, if not the best strategy to get there. Uh, unbundling is a word that creates more confusion, uh, uh, clarifies less. What the plan actually focuses on are some issues that we've heard from businesses in the market, uh, whether it's spe special access, whether it's uh, providing choice for small businesses. We've heard many complaints from small businesses that they lack choice, that their prices are too high. And so the plan suggests uh, several discrete areas where the record showed real uh, competition issues, especially for small businesses, uh, that uh, it tees up uh, an inquiry by the Commission, and I think it's important to look at those. And you, but you understand the fear that we would have uh, if you pursued such a course. Uh, it, it, uh, of course I do. Again, the goals of the Commission very clearly are to adopt policies that promote investment, promote innovation, promote competition, and protect and empower consumers. That is what I've instructed the staff to look at every day. Now, as we look at this in entire document, uh, what, tell me what your next step is. What, what's the time frame that you're, uh, that you're, you're going to try to embark on? Well, the staff has been working on an implementation schedule. Uh, and so in the, uh, 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 in the period ahead, we'll be announcing a schedule for implementing the plan. Uh, I think that there are, uh, as I said during my opening remarks, uh, I'm not satisfied with the status quo. I think this is an extraordinary pa platform for job creation and investment. Uh, there are some very real problems that have been acknowledged on a bipartisan basis that we need to solve. So I'm going to push uh, to move forward as quickly as we can because um, uh, I think it's critical for, for U.S. Uh, uh, world leadership in this area. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Upton. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, the first broadband plan was the 1996 Telecom Act. And uh, the 1996 Telecom Act, of course, um, actually resulted in broadband being regulated under Title II. And from 1996 all the way until August of 2005, uh, broadband was under Title II, just for the record. And during that period of time, uh, we got a lot of policies that uh, were implemented. Um, consumer protection, universal service, protecting consumer privacy, interconnection and competition provisions, access for individuals with disabilities, uh, consumer billing protections. Uh, and what was also possible under Title II? Well, under Title II, the FCC could forbear if it wanted to. And it availed itself of that power. Uh, right up until August of 2005, uh, wherever it thought it was necessary. So I don't think we should pretend that going back to Title II would mean the earth would stop spinning on its axis and the end of times would be upon us. We can achieve a sensible policy balance in Title II just as others assert that we can achieve it in Title I. Now, I know that the FCC is fighting in court to defend the current Title I policy framework. Hopefully, the court will uphold that. But if it doesn't, cool heads will prevail, uh, and we will work with the FCC to ensure that all of the goals uh, that are in this broadband plan, universal service, investment, competition, privacy, disabilities, uh, access, will all be 
uh, implemented. So the agenda for connecting America doesn't change if the FCC uses Title I or Title II. Um, I know that there are some people out there saying they shouldn't have the authority under Title I or Title II. Kind of turn it into an agency that's just kind of enforcing the law, but without any ability to do rulemakings. But I just completely disagree with that. History says that that's completely wrong. And the Telecom Act of 96 was a broadband plan. And this is the next iteration of it. This is broadband plan number two going forward for the 21st century. Do you agree with that interpretation, Chairman Janikowski, of the law? Uh, Congressman Markey, you lived it. Uh, and so Can it, you turn on your microphone, please? Sorry. Uh, you lived it, and so it couldn't possibly be wrong. D during those years, uh, uh, during those years from 1998 to 2008, I was in the private sector. Uh, I was a business <coughs> operator and I was an investor. Uh, and I'm very sensitive to uh, the effects that uh, poor policies can have on investment. I am confident that this FCC will tackle all of these issues in a way that has <coughs> great respect for the private investment that we need to get to world leadership on broadband. Uh, and uh, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, um, uh, the FCC has been operating under Title I. Uh, a company made a decision to challenge that in court. The FCC is defending it. Uh, uh, but I believe we have the authority uh, and, um, uh, uh, and that we will have the authority. Great. And, and I agree with that 100 percent. Otherwise, the whole history of the Telecom Act of 96 makes no sense because all of those regulations were implemented under Title II. So uh, it really doesn't make any difference, except that there are some companies out there uh, that uh, uh, enjoyed the forbearance that was engaged in by the FCC during a particular period of time, uh, would like to just extend it uh, in perpetuity. Uh, and I do not think that would be a good policy for our country. Competitiveness, Darwinian, paranoia-inducing competition is what America should be all about, not forbearing from competition, but inducing it into every single aspect of this communications marketplace. That's how we got Hulu and YouTube and Google and eBay and Amazon. Not one home in America had broadband in February of 1996 when the Telecom Act was signed. Not one home had broadband. Ten years later, we come back and there's a completely different dialogue in our country. One final question, that's on uh, the E-rate, uh, Congresswoman Matsui and uh, Caps and I have both introduced, uh, have all introduced E-rate 2.0 Act to, uh, uh, to change the way in which uh, we look at the E-rate to ensure that there is more access. How do you feel about that, Mr. Chairman? I, I think it's essential. Uh, um, uh, and, and I thank you, of course, and the committee for its work on E-rate over the years. Um, one of the things that I see when I talk to teachers around the country is how frustrated they are um, by the fact that some of their kids have broadband access, some have don't, some don't, uh, uh, and how frustrated they are that their facilities, while we have connected classrooms, aren't good enough to give them what they want. So uh, tackling that is a recommendation of the plan. It owes a lot to, to your leadership with respect to E-rate. Yeah, we, we thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank all of the commissioners for their excellent work uh, on this uh, plan. It is going to actually play a historic role in ensuring that America regains its position as number one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Markey. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Bono Mack, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, first questions are to Commissioners uh, Janikowski and, and uh, McDowell. I'm very concerned about the plan's recommendations to changes in the copyright law expanding the definition of fair use. Can you uh, please explain why this is necessary? Sure. The, the first point to make is that um, it is very important that we make sure that the Internet is not only open, but a safe place to do business, including by uh, owners of copyrights. And so uh, I've been very clear, and the plan is very clear, that we need to make sure that companies can enforce their rights and that, uh, and that we don't have rampant piracy on the Internet. Uh, over the course of our broadband proceeding, we heard from uh, uh, teachers and some in the education community that pointed to some uh, narrow issues where they said um, our ability to do what we would like to do in teaching uh, is inhibited uh, and there may be some ways to fix that that don't challenge the fundamental point that protecting intellectual property is essential. Mr. McDowell. We want to encourage uh, 
owners of copyrighted works to, to put them online. So they need to feel comfortable in doing so. That means they have to enjoy the strongest possible intellectual property rights protection. We have to allow uh, them to work constructively and cooperatively, cooperatively with carriers uh, to uh, uh, police and, 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 and act uh, against uh, stolen intellectual property. So first of all, I, I should start off by saying we're not the expert agency on intellectual property or copyrights. Um, but I am uh, sounding a, a, a note of caution uh, when it comes to any recommendations that could be seen as wanting to weaken intellectual property rights. I think what will actually help the proliferation of new content and applications online will be if we have strong intellectual property rights enforcement. But there's almost no um, discussion in this whole document about legal content uh, protection. Is it not a priority at all for the FCC? There's to either one of you. And I, I, I believe there is some discussion, and we'd be happy to follow up with you on that. Um, uh, uh, IP is not a central issue in the broadband plan. Uh, so there is a, an endorsement of the importance of copyright protections, and then there's an identification of an issue that uh, was raised with us in the record with respect to education and a suggestion for further work on that. I think if you look at sections 11.4, uh, 15.7, and 15.9, there you'll see some uh, discussion there. Uh, but uh, some of the concerns that, when I read it, were that we could be suggesting a weakening of uh, intellectual property rights protection. Thank you. I, just to echo my concern, in, in the document, the example you cite in, in fair use is actually, you say, teachers seeking to use Beatles lyrics to promote literacy is the example uh, that you cite. Now, in, in education, the best way they can improve literacy is to cite the Beatles. Is that, and this is the, this is the example you've used for, for, for this argument. And, and I, do you care to comment on that? Because you just spoke to this very comment about it being, uh, the example that was given to you was the Beatles lyrics. I think what I'd, what I'd be happy to do is make sure that we uh, share with your office the comments that we receive from educators on their concerns in this area, and, uh, and I'm confident that, that the report uh, emphasizes the importance of intellectual property and uh, puts ideas on the table. As you know, it's not self-executing, um, but certainly we'd be happy to, to be a resource to you, and I'd be happy to supply the information that we received in the course of the process on the issues that that, that section addresses. I appreciate that very much. Does anybody else care to comment? I, I'd like to make a, cam a comment. Um, I, I, I have not visited with the teachers or the educational community, so I can't speak to that. But I have, I have visited with consumers and media companies. And video is driving broadband adoption. And for media companies to put their expensive content on the web, they need to have assurance that it's going to be protected. And so I think it's very important that we consider this as we move forward with broadband. And it's very important that we protect intellectual property. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Bodenbach. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you to each one of you. Um, I hung on every word of your testimony and welcomed it. So uh, um, thank you again for the extraordinary work. Um, we know that. Um, or I'm convinced that uh, that you all, uh, through your testimony and otherwise, that you recognize the uh, the need for speed. Uh, but I continue to have some uh, concerns, especially when it comes to uh, spurring competition with new and innovative uh, uses of the spectrum. There are so many uh, entrenched uh, interests that seem to be able to stop new ideas from taking root through delaying tactics. Uh, that keep the spectrum uh, concentrated in the hands of the of uh, larger carriers. I, I, I think this concern has been raised by other members of the committee as well. Um, uh, if we're going to see that 100 megabits reach 100 million homes, um, the FCC has to begin and complete rulemakings faster, um, so we can see immediate action. And uh, I, I don't know what you all have to say about that. I think perhaps it's more in the hands of the chairman. I might be wrong about that. Uh, I, I am disappointed that the advanced uh, wireless spectrum, the AWS-3, uh, was not recommended for uh, immediate employ uh, deployment. Uh, you're not surprised by my comment, uh, Mr. Chairman, on that. It was a, a proceeding that was teed up um, years ago. And I, I don't really think that businesses can um, 
uh, either afford to or should be allowed to have to hang around and lose money for years. Um, it's my understanding that the uh, uh, DOD's uh, um, uh, spectrum band that the uh, National Broadband Plan uh, that you're considering pairing uh, that uh, spectrum with the currently jammed, uh, uh, I think it's jam-packed, uh, with vital systems, including the drones. I'll put on my um, Intelligence Committee hat, the drones for uh, airstrikes in Afghanistan and Pakistan and border security here at home, um, and that these systems uh, in the band cost over $100 billion and can't be relo relocated until 2030. I don't know if you want to comment on this. Um, I, I don't really see the DOD giving up Spectrum. So, um, I mean, have you contacted the DOD? Has the DOD contacted you? Uh, that's my first question. Uh, and, um, uh, and if you don't find a sp a paired uh, spectrum by the October deadline that you outlined in, in the report, are you actually going to auction the spectrum and put it in use as soon as possible? I'm going to continue on my, with my questions and then you can answer them. On uh, the next generation, 911, as I said, uh, Mr. Shimkus and I are co-chairs of the E911 caucus. We've offered legislation. Um, and uh, if you've had a chance to take a look at it, what your, uh, uh, what your take is on that, um, there's so many things to ask about. Well, of course, we're going to submit uh, uh, more questions that you can answer in writing. On public uh, uh, television and, and uh, their broadcast spectrum issues, uh, the public uh, television stations are very different uh, from commercial television stations, as you uh, 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 obviously appreciate. Um, as the Commission looks ahead uh, to rulemakings announced in the plan to reclaim the 120 uh, megahertz of spectrum from these broadcasters, can you give us any ass uh, assurances that public uh, uh, television stations will be protected from involuntary real, uh, real allocations of that spectrum. Um, I think it's important that uh, they are protected. I think it, they represent uh, one of the treasures of our nation. So uh, those are my opening questions, and I'm going to submit more uh, to, to you, to the Commission, to respond to in writing. So whomever would like to answer, I welcome it. I'd be, uh, I'd be happy to, to, uh, to, to do so. On the, um, uh, on the first issue, uh, 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 our staff at the FCC and uh, their colleagues at NTIA and other agencies have been talking about Spectrum, and with respect to the Spectrum you mentioned, they have identified uh, a potential opportunity that could be very good for the country in terms of, of pairing. I completely agree with you that uh, it is a bad practice uh, to extend um, uh, proceedings, petitions indefinitely at the FCC, and one of the things that the plan did was put a deadline on exploration of this pairing uh, alternative. Uh, and, and I believe the plan goes on to say that uh, if the pairing um, is not possible, then the Commission should proceed, uh, adopt rules, and, uh, and auction that spectrum. Uh, with respect to E911, I, um, uh, I think we owe you and Congressman Shimkus thanks uh, for the ideas uh, because uh, I believe that E911 is uh, discussed in the broadband plan, certainly as part of uh, looking to the future on uh, public safety in the 21st century and broadband, uh, tackling 911 in the way that people are actually using communications devices is essential. And on public TV, uh, the answer to your question is, is yes. And um, uh, I think for public TV too, there's an opportunity here for a win-win. Uh, and that's something that I hope we can work on uh, with everyone together in the proceedings that we'll launch. Thank you very much. And, uh I'm very excited. Uh, this, it's as if the cobwebs are, are being cleared and we have uh, a vision for our future. And I really look forward to working with the Commission and the full uh, subcommittee uh, on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Eshoo. The gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you all again for being here. Um, I, I've got to tell you, the, the lack of attention to intellectual property and the way you're punting the question is um, a little bit troubling. 
uh, to me. I, I think that you have to look at the fact that broadband, you're talking about wanting broadband, a robust broadband deployment and expansion, and to not have some of the intellectual property protections, and I know you're not the central agency that handles that, but I do think that it is worthy of a revisit from you. The expansion of fair use is of concern to me. One of my songwriters terms it fairly useful way to steal my money. And that's his version of fair use. So I, I think that uh, I would encourage you all to have a revisit on, on that. I've got about seven questions. I'm not going to get through all of them. So uh, Commissioner McDowell, you had uh, mentioned something I want to go back to, the notion of net neutrality, having net neutrality, and that, that, would, that those net neutrality rules could complicate the efforts to enforce the laws. Uh, on illegal content, uh, illegal downloading online. I'd, I'd like for you just to expand a little bit about that relationship between net neutrality rules and um, enforcement against illegal content. Sure. First of all, the proposed rules uh, do call for a carve out for enforcement of such things as uh, uh, illegal content, not just uh, intellectual property uh, theft, but uh, child pornography or things involving national security, et cetera. Um, but I think my concern with adopting those rules uh, in general is uh, the amount of uncertainty that it will uh, inject. Uh, we've talked about today extensively Title I versus Title II. I'll be uh, filing a letter with the committee regarding my position on that. But that is being litigated before the courts. Uh, and these things do take years. Uh, in the meantime, uh, w would new rules actually give uh, network operators pause in terms of acting on a number of fronts, including the enforcement of intellectual property, uh, where it might not be so clear, especially if we are talking about relaxing or, or undermining fair, you know, expanding fair use, uh, undermining of the, of the uh, existing protections. So I think it, it creates uncertainty. You know, um, after the 96 Act, we had the, you know, the legislative and then regulation and then litigation cycle that went on for better part of a decade. Right. Uh, I would think that after we try to promulgate such rules, we would have at least a half a decade of such uncertainty, and that is probably not good for intellectual property rights holders. Okay. Mr. Chairman, uh, let's go back to uh, Commissioner Baker's comment where, you know, talking about the media companies uh, and the push to get that content on there because of the way people are doing research. So if you want to ensure both a row a robust broadband deployment and the protection of intellectual property and that content from those copyright industries that are going to be essential and are going to contribute to that growth, then how are you going to go about that? I think we've got to realize that our core copyright industries contributed nearly a quarter of the real growth we had in our economy last year. And you're talking about you know, ease of access here. So how are you going to marry those two? We're all interested in it. We've got a lot of innovators that have invested a lot of money in new platforms. So how do you make that guarantee? Well, I, 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 one is I, I, I couldn't be more firm in my conviction that it's essential to be able to protect intellectual property on the Internet. I've been clear about this since the first day I've sworn in and chairman, uh, as chairman. I understand that one uh, it will be video, I agree with Commissioner Baker, uh, and other content that will be an important part of driving broadband everywhere. And one of the main ways that uh, a strong broadband policy will promote job creation and innovation in the country. So uh, uh, there, there's, uh, I, I think in general, I'm in uh, complete agreement with you uh, uh, on this. I think we have to be um, uh, sensitive as a commission to suggestions that we have uh, from teachers or others saying, can you look at narrow issues to see what makes sense? We wouldn't do anything in this area without a robust, open, uh, participatory proceeding that heard views from everyone's involved, and I think that's our, I think that's our job. But, um, um, well, I should stop there, but uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. Well, that we're out of time, so that'll be fine. And thank you again so much to all of you for your preparation and being here. And Mr. Chairman, I will submit the balance of my questions, and we are appreciative for your efforts today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Blackburn. The uh, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak, is recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Janikowski, uh, Mr. Waxman spent a little bit of time on public safety. So let, let me have a couple questions like follow up on. The National Broadband Plan proposes roaming and priority access to public safety or organizations for all license holders in the 700 megahertz realm. What type of obligations would be placed on commercial providers to ensure that public safety is given more than just a priority access, but also a robust and resilient access, access at times of emergency? Well, the details of that uh, are exactly the kind of thing that would be worked out in the rulemaking that will hold. Uh, but that is the, uh, uh, what you describe is the goal, uh, to uh, put in place a mechanism where public safety can have prioritized access to spectrum that it needs. Uh, the team that has worked so hard on this uh, and has consulted uh, with everyone uh, involved believes that there is a path uh, that can work for public safety and deliver on the 9-11 Commission recommendations and that is also reasonable for, um, uh, for the wireless industry and that takes advantage of this unique moment in time where if we do this as the commercial networks are being built out, we can get it done uh, do it efficiently and deliver on the 9-11 Commission recommendations. Well, in order to it to work, though, you're going to have to have a ready and willing commercial partner uh, to work with for law enforcement. And, and are you confident that we're going to have it in all parts of America, especially our rural areas? Uh, if they don't, how, how would public safety proceed to to have this plan? Or, or this is a, I asked this question of our team um, uh, because I wanted to make sure that the plan that was being proposed met these goals. They are confident that this mechanism will work for public safety uh, and that uh, commercial providers uh, will provide the access that's described in the plan. Even in the areas that are not developed now? I, I believe that's the case. It's certainly something we'd be happy to follow up with you. Oh, sorry, the areas that are not developed now, the idea is that as we push forward on a 4G mobile broadband network everywhere, it would be developed uh, and that actually it would accelerate build out of 4G networks in rural areas because we can do the commercial networks and the public safety networks together. I fear that if we don't do that, um, uh, in some areas we won't get any 4G networks, in some areas we might get commercial and no public safety at all because as Commissioner McDowell mentioned, there is public safety spectrum that's there, it's not being built. And uh, the but central goal here is to get it built. You mentioned 4G, but then yet in the mobility fund, you provide for support for a, a 3G wireless network. So I guess that's, Seems like it, uh, are you going to get the 4G then to help out law enforcement in those areas when the minimum is going to be a 3G in that uh, Connect um, America fund? I, I think it is in, in your proposal. So, and plus you're going to support one carrier with subsidies in a given geographic area, right? Underneath this uh, Connect America fund. So, how, how will you determine which broadband provider in a given area would receive support if they're only supposed to be 3G, but yet you're talking about public safety needs 4G? How, how do we get there? How do we bridge that? Well, the 3G network, sir, would be the foundation for the 4G network. So I do think this right. is part of a solution to, to make it happen. W with respect to the other issues, uh, I, I think you're raising issues that, of course, will take up in the course of developing the rulemaking. In, in the meantime, we'd be happy to follow up with you on more information that went into the development of this, uh, of this plan. Well, let me ask you one more since we might have to look to the future development. Then in the inter-carrier compensation scheme that's going to be sort of in the universal service fund, phased out, what, over 10 years? It's, is that what it is? Okay. Then <clears throat> how does the FCC plan to ensure that the necessary support for rural telecommunications remain in places considering how, in, how essential the implicit support is to many of these rural companies? Well, we believe that the, that the plan proposed a transformation over 10 years okay. um, uh, will have that uh, result. Uh, as I said uh, to one of the earlier questions, the team has also suggested an alternative uh, to accelerate the transition. Um, there's the possibility of uh, identifying additional funding. That's a choice that we'd be happy to work with the committee on. But the goal of the plan uh, would be to deliver exactly what you're seeking for rural America. Well, I appreciate the goals and the thought and analysis that went into this. It's just that whenever we do, uh, whether it's a Telecommunications Act of 96 or anything, it's always rural areas, we'll get to you. We're still waiting. And, and, and in law enforcement, uh, <coughs> well, it's, it's, it's even greater. You say you need 4G. We can't even get the basic cable up in some of those areas uh, or DSL. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. Uh, Commissioner Cobb, I got about four seconds left. Uh, the uh, bill we introduced uh, 
uh, FCC Collaboration Act. Give me a, just a quick comment on why we need it, and hopefully we can convince the chairman, even though he's indicated we might get a hearing on it here soon, uh, why we need this. Well, I want to commend you again on uh, introducing the uh, legislation to make this possible. I just think it would be a great step forward uh, from the standpoint of uh, uh, dispatching the business of the commission. You know, we were all uh, standing around in the uh, in the room out uh, front waiting for the hearing to start here, and it was an opportunity. We could have talked about some stuff on broadband, maybe resolved a problem or two, I don't know, but we all, all had to get lockjaw at that point because we would be delving into the world of substance. So I think from the standpoint of... Uh, uh, doing business. You got five people here who come from five very different uh, backgrounds with hopefully different talents to contribute to the cause, different perspectives. You can only benefit from those folks sitting around and, and, and talking about uh, about these issues. That serves the public interest. You do it with the council present. Uh, you build in protections, but uh, the system we have right now disserves the public interest and retards the ability of the commission to discharge its obligations in a timely public uh, interest friendly fashion. And uh, there was one reform that I could make at the FCC, the one you propose would be it. Thank Mr. you very Chairman, much, Mr. Commissioner Clyburn. Clyburn wanted but, to comment Mr. on it. Mr. Chairman, if, if you would allow. Uh, one, uh, one example to uh, augment that, um, I have the opportunity to chair the joint board for U at USF. Uh, well, all of the joint boards. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and, and one of the things, and, and my colleagues uh, are, are members, I distinctly remember on our inaugural call, which you had a not, lot of new voices because uh, it was virtual. Uh, a lot of uh, voices um, on the line. And Commissioner Copps was in the middle of a very significant point. And it was 17 minutes after the hour when Commissioner Baker, and she was quite on time, um, uh, uh, came into the room. Uh, and Commissioner Copps had to get offline. So what happens uh, is we lost that um, exchange. And just lost that train of thought, and it's very, a very cumbersome process. So I, I thank you for recognizing that even on that level where no votes would be taken, that, um, that the, this country and the Joint Board would be better served in having a, 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 a process that is uh, more relaxed. Thank you uh, very much, you, Mr. Mr. Levern and Mr. Stupak. And let me assure you there will be a hearing on your measure in the not-too-distant future. Right. The uh, gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Griffith, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. Who, when you mention staff, is it your staff that's going to uh, make the recommendations so that we remain uh, competitive and um, uh, <coughs> enhance the creativity of, the, of our uh, internet? I think it's the FCC staff is what I was referring to. Well, uh, it's the FCC staff. Is there a, a, is, is there a group that's specifically in tune with what has happened in the marketplace in the last 10 years and has a relationship with that marketplace? Uh, well, that, it's, a, it's a great question. That is the job of the staff of the agency, to be proactive, to stay on top of market developments, uh, and to make right. sure that we have the skill sets necessary to do our job. Right. And so those individuals have had experience in the marketplace or, uh, and, and understand the reality of the, of the, of the capitalistic system and the uh, development and the uh, risk capital and that sort of thing? Uh, is I, that a, is that a fair? I, I come from 10 years in the private sector and taking this job, and we have, I have focused on bringing in to the staff uh, a broad collection of people with backgrounds in operating businesses and investment firms, uh, uh, as well as people who have uh, uh, other relevant experiences. I think that's how we do our job best, to put a room together of people with different backgrounds and disciplines and have them focused on doing the right thing for the country. Uh, but certainly making sure that people have a very real understanding of technology, the marketplace, uh, what drives investment decisions is essential to me. Will it be five or six staff members that will be assigned to the uh, development of the, uh, of the language uh, and how it might affect uh, private investment? I think, um, I think the, the, the implementation of the plan will be worked on by many more staff members than that. Well, I would just, I'm, where I'm going is I would love for you to identify those for me, and I would love to sit and see their resumes and also talk with them, if that would be fair, uh, because it's of great interest to me, having been in the communication field once before. And 
uh, in the interest of the health care bill that we just went through, I have read that bill and there is no, no uh, provision in the health care bill for, for broadband envy. So we've got, uh, <laughs> that's a joke. Uh, we, uh, we, we hope that you guys can solve that problem for us here. And thank you very much for being here. We appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. Griffith. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, in many districts, even like mine in Sacramento, there are far too many households who cannot afford broadband services. And a recent survey conducted by the FCC found that 93 million, 93 million Americans do not subscribe to in-home broadband services, in large part because of affordability barriers. The fact is, is the high cost of broadband leaves far too many lower income families in urban and rural areas at a severe disadvantage in our economy. Last September, I introduced the Broadband Affordability Act to expand the USF Lifeline Assistance Program for universal broadband adoption. This bill will ensure that all Americans, whether they live in urban, suburban, or rural areas, all have access to affordable broadband services. Chairman Janikowski, I am very I applaud you, actually, and the commissioners for including um, this proposal as a central element of your plan. How important is it, in your view, is it for our economy and for the matter of our country to fully close the digital divide? I think, I think it's essential, and I, I, I appreciate your leadership on this, and it is included in the, in the plan. Uh, Ten years ago, if you were looking for a job, you'd get a newspaper, you'd look at the classifieds, um, and that's how you'd look for a job. Today, job postings have moved online. Um, uh, uh, most jobs require online applications. If you don't have internet access, uh, you are disadvantaged in looking for a job. More and more jobs require basic digital skills and digital literacy. Uh, and so it's very important that we move forward on this. It's one of our biggest gaps, too, globally, where other countries are ahead of us on adoption rates. So it's a very important challenge. Uh, there's no silver bullet, and the plan recommends a number of different strategies to tackle adoption issues. Now, if uh, this program to expand the Lifeline Link-Up program for universal broadband service were, adopt were implemented, in your view, how much do you estimate to increase the broadband adoption rates in urban and rural areas? Well, we've, we've set a goal in the plan of moving from 65 percent to 90 percent adoption over the next 10 years, which, which would be uh, a third as fast, two-thirds as fast as, as the adoption rate with telephone. Um, with respect to Lifeline Link-Up, we want to move forward as quickly as we can with smart pilot projects so we can identify what works, what really moves the needle on adoption, and then focus our energies on those. And that would be both in urban and rural areas? Yes. Okay, that's great. Yes. Um, I had, in my opening remarks, um, Broadband is going to play a major role in a sustainable path to clean energy economy, improving energy efficiency standards, and lessen our dependence on foreign oil. As I mentioned before, I'll soon be introducing legislation that will complement many of the recommendations made in your plan to modernize our nation's smart grid. In doing so, we'll make our smart grid more reliable and efficient and ensure res resilience to natural disasters and empower consumers to make more energy efficient and economic decisions about their energy usage. Chairman Janikowski, how important do you believe that broadband is to modernize our nation's smart grid? I, I think it's essential. I think Congress was wise in instructing us to prepare a broadband plan to ask us to look at the relationship between broadband and energy, health care, education. There's a section in the plan, as you know, uh, but it's going to be critical to integrate broadband with our smart grid. Uh, both critical and efficient, uh, and ultimately re result in very significant savings and benefits for the country. Well, can you expand on the point made in the plan about the importance of ensuring that consumers have greater access to information about their electricity usage? And why is this so important? What are the barriers in order to providing them that access? There's um, terrific innovation going on in the space with uh, uh, products that help consumers visualize their energy use and a lot of evidence that that translates directly into energy savings. Uh, many of those technologies rely on broadband connectivity and often wireless connectivity uh, to, to fully see and fully visualize. So uh, homes that don't have access to broadband or haven't adopted broadband uh, are not able to uh, get the benefits of, uh, uh, of those kinds of technologies. 
And so in, in a number of different areas here, the nature of broadband as a general purpose technology that can fuel so much innovation, uh, investment, uh, uh, and benefit producing activity applies very much to energy and this is a good example. Well, in Sacramento, um, the utility district received a $129 million grant for Smart Grid. And uh, in talking, we felt it was very important to look at that and look at broadband and how the, the connection of this is so important when you think about the community and what we need to do and to see the relationships. I think mean, that's really very important too because for some reason I think when you think about things like smart meters and, and being able to find out what's being used in your house, people seem to understand that this is somehow connected to broadband. So I think it's important and I, I'm very grateful that you have that in your plan. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Matsui. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks again, Commissioners. Uh, Mr. Janikowski, I have to say, very impressive guy, and I, I, I like a lot what you're saying. But when I went back and took a look at your statement um, on September 17th at the hearing, nowhere in this statement does it talk about net neutrality. Not once. Great statement. You get tears in your eyes reading this thing. I want to stand up and salute the flag. And then four days later, you introduce a rule, a pretty sweeping rule, on net neutrality. Today I heard you tell this panel that I'm for a light touch on regulation. That's what's generated all of this competition. And yet your FCC was doing oral arguments arguing where you had the ability to regulate the Internet. And I am, maybe you can help me understand uh, how we get from that position to net neutrality and your position of today that you're telling me now that, which I like to hear, light touch on regulation, you can argue the case that you have the ability to do that, even though the, appears to me by reading the, the, the case that the three judge panel was, was pretty tough on your position. Could you help me understand that, sir? Sure. I think, it, you know, it's, it's been, uh, I've been very public for quite a long time on my very strong view that clear high-level rules to preserve a free and open internet are pro-investment rules, pro-competition, pro-innovation, that uh, we have uh, uh, an obligation to make sure that the open architecture of the internet that has served the country so well continues going forward. Uh, so I, I see real consistency between uh, my uh, priorities of innovation and investment and preserving a free uh, and open uh, internet. The very things that you, that you reference actually in your speech to the Brookings Institute where you um, talked about, you know, Chevrolet and hot dogs and apple pie, great stuff. <laughs> but you, the, the, some of the things that you reference, Netscape, a great, uh, started in Ann Arbor, Michigan, we're very proud of that. The, uh, uh, the Facebook, those other innovations didn't happen because of the, this, this social justice notion we're going to have this exchange of information and we're going to be in the backyard and have kumbaya and play drums. It happened because somebody was going to make some money, right? Absolutely. And so what you're saying is, I believe in the light touch, I believe in a free and open internet, that's why we're going to regulate the internet. Uh, and and, no, and I'll I'll, you, there is no such thing as being a little bit pregnant. When you start getting into regulation of the internet, you're going to make determinations. You have to make determinations. And you're arguing the fact that you absolutely have the ability to do it. I agree with the three-judge panel. I don't think you do. I'd love to know. Obviously, we're going to disagree. You think it's consistent uh, that you can do that. I don't think you are. You need to help me understand where does it say, in what section of the law, and what you're arguing that gives you the FCC the ability to regulate the Internet. Well, uh, 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 we are not in favor, I am not in favor of regulating the Internet. Um, but you're in favor of net neutrality, which is regulating the Internet. I completely disagree with that, sir. Uh, it's about, uh, in fact, some companies have come to us to suggest that we regulate the Internet, and we've resisted it. Uh, the FCC has, uh, for many decades, uh, had rules that apply to the on-ramps for the Internet to promote competition to make sure that those are free and open and fair. And I do think that we should continue that in the Internet world so that the next Facebooks, the next eBay, the next uh, Netscapes uh, have the ability to innovate, to invent, and as you say, I completely agree, get a return on their investment by having a fair chance to reach a market. 
And I agree with you, but when, you, when the federal government, the FCC, gets into the business of setting up what those rules are you, that don't exist today, you have regulated the Internet. I don't know how you cross that barrier and think that there's no, no harm, no foul. There clearly is. And I'll tell you what will happen. As a member here who I'm a complete free market guy, I believe in the, the market, I think it works. Now we're going to create these big programs to get broadband, broadband to people because maybe you have all gotten in and regulated the Internet where there isn't a clear market solution, but there might be, in your terms, uh, at least Mr. Copps's view, I think, a social justice issue for having that broadband at the House. Now you've completely dismantled the very model that got us to 200 million folks uh, having access to broadband. And how you don't intertwine that is, is beyond me. And I guess my concern is, is exactly that. You say here, light touch, four days later, you uh, unleash a, a pretty aggressive, first time ever, I would argue, a regulation of the Internet. Today you say late touch. What's next? I mean, obviously you're this is something you're wedded to and you're clearly uh, committed to this. Um, and I think Mr. McDowell pointed out the section. I apologize. I don't know. I think it was section 17. Is that right, sir? Did I get that right? I mean, so you've clearly laid out the platform to do this. Um, and is it, your, is it your position that you're going to continue uh, to pursue, uh, at least in the in court, that you have the right to regulate the Internet. If, if I may, sir, when I started at the FCC, the prior administration had uh, adopted first a set of principles regarding a free and open Internet, then enforced those principles against a company. It was the prior administration that did it. That's why we're now in court. It took those um, uh, 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 principles and attached them as conditions to a merger. So I inherited um, uh, a landscape uh, around this area where uh, um, there were open internet rules in effect, but they were confusing to people, diminishing predictability and certainty. I think it's important to adopt clear, high-level rules of the road that encourage innovation, competition, uh, and that make clear what's not permitted, and almost anyone involved in this will tell you there are some things you shouldn't be able to do, make clear what is permitted, uh, and then have a fair process for disputes to be resolved. And I would, I'd, I'd be happy to work with you on that. I think there's a way to do this that's completely consistent with an investment uh, growth and competition. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rogers. Your time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I've really enjoyed this hearing so far. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a question concerning access. Uh, do you believe that pursuing a purely engineering approach to meeting data flow challenges would make net neutrality an obsolete issue? Um, uh, I, I would be uh, pleased. One of the, the suggestions that I made in um, uh, the rulemaking that we proposed was to increase transparency, to increase the information about the engineering um, uh, 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 network management rules that would be available to entrepreneurs and CTOs, I think it would have the positive effect of minimizing disputes, minimizing the government role. Uh, and so if that's what you're referring to, it's something that I, that I would like to pursue. Well, what I'm, what I'm getting at is that a purely engineering approach would uh, uh, basically expand the capability of the existing spectrum, uh, and that may be enough to over override whatever net neutrality issues are. Um, Commissioner McDowell, you have uh, your head shaking there. I, I think you're on the right track, absolutely. I, th I think what can actually obviate the need for, uh, first of all, there is no need. The, the Internet is not broken in this regard. But what, what we really, the ultimate antidote to potential anti-competitive behavior is more competition, especially in the last mile. The most, most robust area for that competition recently has been wireless. The Commission has worked hard for years since the chairmanship of Michael Powell, for instance, on getting unlicensed use of the TV white spaces out to market. This is something that in November of 2008, with great fanfare, we announced a groundbreaking order, a 5-0 bipartisan unanimous vote. It was absolutely a wonderful moment, but we have bogged down in our, our, in our progress there. Something like the, the use of unlicensed use of the, of the white spaces could actually absolutely obviate the need for any rules. I, I dispute that there is a need right now, and the record doesn't have any evidence that there is. But um, you're absolutely right. So also with new technologies, cognitive radio, software-defined radio, uh, new antenna, uh, smart antenna technologies, uh, all of these can allow us 
from a wireless perspective to have more competition in the last mile wirelessly so that you have multiple providers and consumers have a, a wonderful, robust marketplace to choose from. Thank you. I have another question for you, Commissioner McDowell. Do you feel that the plan uh, will succeed in meeting the six goals that are identified? Do you think the plan as written and published? Uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, first of all, it's, it's obviously a very ambitious plan. Uh, it's very lengthy. There are uh, several hundred recommendations, some of which are for the FCC to do, some of which are for other agencies to do, some of which are for Congress to do. So all those moving parts, I think it's going to be very difficult to say all of them are going to realize uh, mm -hmm. the, their, the hope of their recommendations. Uh, but uh, we can always be optimistic. One more question for you, if you don't mind. Um, well, I certainly uh, uh, appreciate the, dish, the risk of additional regulation. Uh, and as I mentioned in my opening statement, creating jobs is, is very important to me considering the situation of my district and the country. Uh, and, I, and I wish to work with the Commission on, on that issue as we move forward. Uh, do you think there's any risk of abuse uh, without further regulation, without additional regulation? Is that something you see as a, as a potential problem? Well, I think in the context of, for instance, of our net neutrality proceeding, the Department of Justice, the Antitrust Division, uh, filed comments in early January, which is very rare for the Antitrust Division to do that. Uh, it examined the marketplace and uh, not only said, was it not broken? In other words, there, there was not concentration and abuse of market power. It was actually downright optimistic uh, that uh, there is a, a competitive marketplace for broadband and that more competition is coming, especially because of wireless. The Federal Trade Commission also examined this in 2007, issued a 5-0 bipartisan unanimous report that uh, said that we need to be very careful. This is a competitive marketplace, and uh, while new rules might have the best of intentions, they could create regulatory uncertainty. So I think there's great risk there. Any other commissioners care to take a stab at that? As it relates to uh, competition, sir, I, I'm concerned about the future. Um, in Chapter 4 of the plan, it talks about what 2012 looks like. And it talks about uh, cable uh, out rolling, um, rolling out its uh, DOCSIS 3.0 um, a product which will provide incredible speed, up to 100 mega, the, the goal, mm -hmm. inc incredible uh, potential um, high speed. What it also points out is that um, in the market that we're speaking, that competition may only exist in up to 15 percent of the market. So we, we, if we talk about, um, uh, you know, prices and, and, and service quality and the like, I, I am a bit concerned because um, I don't see robust competition in that particular uh, segment in terms of high-speed uh, deployment or an avail and availability in the couple, next couple of years. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate and understand the concern. I, my concern is that we proactively produce regulations when we're talking about a marketplace in, in the future. I think that right now the market is competitive and any significant change in the regulatory environment will. Um, cause uh, investment to dwindle, and that will cause jobs to dwindle. And I think uh, we need to be very careful when we tread in this area. Okay. Thank you, my time. Thank you Clark. very much, Mr. McNerney. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blunt, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Let me move over here. Thank you, Chairman, for for the time. Let me ask, uh, see what questions I can ask, and which questions we'll submit later. Uh, the first question would be, in, in uh, 2007, uh, the FCC determined that a wireless service uh, is not required to provide another wireless carrier with roaming services if the second carrier holds a wireless license or spectrum usage uh, in the same geographic location. Is there anything in this plan that changes that? And Mr. Copps, you were there in seven. If you want to answer that. Uh, uh, I think what we're trying to do is, is trying to uh, revisit that a little bit uh, on the premise that roaming uh, is essential, I think, to, uh, to a competitive uh, environment and looking at the in-market exception that was uh, put in place at that time. Uh, several of the carriers are telling us that this is uh, inhibit the smaller ones, inhibiting their ability to, uh, uh, to interconnect and to uh, do business as they would like. So I think the Commission is well advised, and the Chairman can speak better to this, uh, uh, but is looking at uh, uh, trying to take another look at that and see what, if any, changes need to be made at this point. So, Chairman, your sense is there would be some potential there is th th that this will reverse some of that 2007 structure? Uh, I, I wouldn't. 
I wouldn't say that, um, uh, 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 mostly because that process, that proceeding hasn't happened yet. If I remember correctly, the plan does identify uh, roaming uh, as an issue uh, whose resolution could affect the speed of deployment and acceleration and competition in the broadband, uh, in the mobile broadband market, and uh, suggest that it's something that the Commission needs to look at. Now, the, the previous view was if you had a if you had a license to serve the area already, if you were, you were required to provide your own service. Mr. Bedell, do you have a view on that? I think as a policy matter, what we need to uh, encourage is uh, build out of your home region. Uh, so uh, I think what you're referring to is there was a concern in 07, I was there too, that uh, we wanted to make sure roaming wasn't just a substitute for resale. If you had a license and weren't building out in your home region, uh, we wanted to provide a disincentive for that and an incentive for you to build out your own network so you can become self-sufficient so that uh, the spectrum could be used more efficiently and consumers could be better served. So I think that's got to be a fundamental policy objective for us is to encourage build out in your home region and therefore everywhere. Okay, thank you. Let's go to broadcast TV for a minute. Uh, this committee in this Congress uh, passed a bill out where the FCC would create an inventory of all the spectrum out there, how it's currently being used. Uh, that's never been voted on by either the House or the Senate. Uh, and I think this uh, report calls for uh, the, addition, the need to find another 500 megahertz of, uh, of spectrum. Uh, do, do you think it would be helpful to analyze how the spectrum is currently being used and would you encourage uh, us to, to move forward and ask the FCC to find out how the, how the spectrum is currently being used uh, before you just go out and try to find 500 <clears throat> megahertz of spectrum? Any, anybody can answer Sure, I, I'd be happy to, to tackle that. The, the spectrum inventory bill is very important and it reflects a recognition of the importance of spectrum and mobile to our economic landscape. Um, uh, much is known already. Uh, the demands on our mobile network, the constraints that we're heading into uh, are very clear based on the record. And of course the FCC uh, uh, um, uh, has information about where licensees are. Uh, the wireless industry in the course of our proceeding on broadband came and suggested that we need 800 megahertz of spectrum to satisfy uh, forthcoming mobile needs. Uh, 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 the, the staff of the FCC did work and thought the 500 megahertz was a, was a reasonable goal. Uh, there's been record development with respect to broadcast spectrum and record development with respect to the win-win the idea that's in the plan. Of course, there's a lot more work to do, and we look forward to working with the committee to find uh, a sensible way to uh, unleash spectrum for economic activity, to make sure that broadcasters are treated fairly, that viewers are served, and that um, where there's a possibility to generate billions of dollars uh, of revenue through auctions that we do so. Okay. Well, I thought, the, I thought this committee was right when we encouraged that... Uh that you be uh, funded, allowed, directed to, to make that review, and I hope we do that. Um, but if, if we don't do that, what's the impact of over-the-air broadcasting uh, on, on any spectrum uh, reallocation? I know we have some areas uh, all over the state that aren't served by the same over-the-air broadcast they were uh, before uh, the digital conversion. How much worse does that get as we begin to reallocate uh, spectrum and you know, we have lots of areas in America that are still uh, either you, you pay for the satellite or you, you have over the air broadcasting or you don't have television. The, the goal of the proceeding would be to uh, respect the needs of viewers, especially those who, uh, uh, who, still, oh, uh, those who still get their TV signal over the air. The congestion issues that we're concerned about are chiefly large market issues. And we can make uh, substantial progress for the country if, in a small number of large markets, a small number of broadcasters share spectrum. We can free up very significant amount of, amounts of spectrum for our mobile broadband economy, uh, generating auction revenues. Uh, so again, I'm confident that there's a win-win here. I think the issues will be much less in rural areas because the congestion issues on the mobile broadband side are, are less intense. Well, that could be, though, a lot of the, uh, the, a lot of the, the, the unserved people that were served before the other conversion are the people closest to the station, uh, closest to the tower, if you're on that, uh, that higher 
uh, number on the on the band. But we, we, I have some other questions on unserved and underserved and other things, and we'll submit those for your answers in writing. Again, thank all of you for being here, Dane. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Blunt. The gentlelady lady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, again, welcome. The, my question, first question is hopefully just for the record, Mr. Chairman. Um, states mean states and territories, yeah. wherever we see that in the plan. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, before coming to Energy and Commerce, I was on Homeland Security, so the issue of interoperability is, was, was and remains a big challenge and one I'm very concerned about. Um, I've heard some concerns that the 10 megahertz of broadband might be inadequate for public safety needs, either now or in the future. Uh, listening to your prior comments, it seems that you were pretty satisfied um, that you were meeting the needs of public safety in this re regard. So do you have concerns that there's not enough, or do you plan to expand the spectrum later on? As I mentioned to Chairman Waxman, my, my charge to the team at the FCC, which is led by uh, a wonderful 30-year admiral, was to take a fresh look at uh, public safety mobile communications needs and recommend an overall plan that would most quickly and effectively deliver on the 9-11 Commission recommendations. Uh, as Commissioner McDowell mentioned, there's 24 megahertz that's already been allocated. It's not being used because there's no strategy to build the network. Uh, and so this plan, which includes several elements, is a plan to get the network built, um, uh, to act consistent with the authority we have now to auction uh, uh, the, the, that 10 megahertz 10. you're referring to, the D block. Uh, I do have tremendous faith in our team and in their commitment to delivering on the 9-11 Commission recommendations. Thank you. Everyone feel the same way? Okay. Um, Commissioner Clyburn, in, when you came before us in the initial um, hearing with the commission, you talked a lot about the concern about um, preserving diversity and local programming, as well as closing the gaps for women, women and minorities. Do you feel that the plan provides uh, enough capacity potential to, to meet those concerns? It, it provides some promise, but I, I remain concerned on, uh, on some fronts. Um, the concern um, for me is uh, when we talk about, and I am not, I am for uh, a voluntary uh, spectrum uh, reallocation. Um, but what the potential of that is that some of these entities who may be financially strapped may be the first to sell uh, their space, which would possibly further dilute the, the gains and um, the, the, our quest for uh, diversity um, and with voices. But the frontier, when I look at the overall plan, as a, uh, I, I am hopeful because it provides a whole host of opportunities um, that um, some are named and some are not. You know, low-power television, um, uh, entertainment, and um, other types of um, sourcing or programming over the internet. Um, there are growing enterprises and, and, and artists. Um, who exclusively want to stay in that space because of the flexibility it, and the uh, the potential for keeping more of their dollars. So while I'm concerned on the other front, I am hopeful that this space um, will be one that um, th literally the sky is the limit in terms of potential for uh, diverse voices. And so would it be the role of the FCC to do the outreach to make sure that um, these smaller entities n know what's available, or is it our role, or is it CBC's role, or? I, I think it's very much um, a, a global effort. Um, when I go out and, and speak, I say just that, the more positive aspect. Um, a young lady came up to me and said, you know, I'm in my senior year of college, you know, what do I do? Um, you know, I want to get into broadcasting. And I am a proponent of in the meantime. In the meantime, you have a vehicle, a relatively affordable vehicle um, through the internet to promote yourself, to produce uh, yourself. Um, and, and so I, I look at this as both of an opportunity and a bridge uh, to the, uh, whatever comes next. Thank you. Um, let me just ask this question. I know that preserving and stimulating competition is a major part of, of the plan, but are there any new mandates 
imposed on industry, and anybody can answer this, um, in the broadband plan, and if so, what industries might have mandates that might require additional investment? Well, the, the plan itself is not self-executing. There are a number of ideas in the plan to uh, promote competition. I spoke earlier about the complaints that we've heard at the Commission from small businesses uh, who, who want to move on to broadband but are dissatisfied with the choice that they have and, and their prices. And we hear from other uh, uh, competitors who have raised issues, and the plan identifies a, a number of issues that require further work. Thank you. My time is up, Mr. Chairman or I yield back whatever is left. Thank you very much, Ms. Christensen. The uh, gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's been asked before, but I haven't asked it, uh, <laughs> as the old saying goes. But I am going to ask it in a little bit different way regarding the uh, over-the-air TV spectrum. Uh, the, the plan suggests the option of being able to give back or sell back, I'm not sure. Uh, that part of the spectrum. The second half of that is uh, does if uh, if there are not enough uh, station holders willing to give back some of their spectrum, uh, we've heard that you won't just force it, but does the FCC even have authority to force uh, them to give back or the authority to take back some of that spectrum. Do you guys have that authority? With, with respect to authority, the authority that we don't have is to structure what we've called an incentive auction, where um, uh, with respect to any band, uh, we have the ability to ensure that, 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 um, uh, that any spectrum that's used that way, uh, that some of the auction proceeds benefit the license holders. On, on, on the first question, again, I would emphasize that um, both that there, there is a real issue ahead of us for the country in our ability to lead the world in mobile. Um, uh, we have all the ingredients lining up with the incredible innovation that we're seeing, uh, with the fact that we're moving quickly to 4G to lead the world. Uh, and we'd be happy to share with you the, the data that shows the gap that we're going to face between capacity. Oh, I, I'm well aware. I'm just wondering if if you have that authority or whether Congress would have to give you that authority to, to grab back that spectrum if they don't voluntarily offer it to you. My understanding is that the authority that we lack is the incentive auction. So you think it, if it's just we're going to take that back, you have the authority to do that without Congressional? I think in general with respect to licensees, okay. they are licensees of spectrum. Okay. Uh, which is also a follow-up question about uh, giving it back, whether you could buy it back, they're leasing it. I don't know if they would have the power to resell that anyway uh, without the FCC allowing that or Congress. So um, just overall, the way I, I, I like the plan in part, and of course, we're always going to disagree with some of the details out here. Uh, but one of them, I view this plan as mostly uh, an infrastructure, but a lot of the opening statements was on uh, take rate. And I think that's an interesting discussion of access versus acceptance. Um, and so I want to talk about uh, what part of the plan do you think is important uh, on the take rate, which then dovetails into the buzzword affordable. Um, and I think that's a term of art, not necessarily science. Um, and so are there mandates in here on pricing or how would you make this quote unquote affordable so more people take it once we get the infrastructure and access out there? And I will open that up to any of them that, uh, Chairman, you've been a good, uh, done a good job of burdening and shouldering uh, most of the answers and questions. Uh, I'm, I'll get us going quickly, and then well, we can go to Michael. He's, he's, he needs to be involved. More. Well, I think number one, uh, ensuring that there is a competitive environment out there that helps drive down consumer costs is is one way you get this uh, stuff out and make it uh, affordable. I think uh, uh, digital literacy uh, is important so that people understand the importance of this to their individual lives and to the uh, uh, to the future of the nation. Uh, going back for just a second to that previous question uh, uh, you asked about, uh, you, you know, licenses all expire. 
So you know, we're not necessarily talking about going in and grabbing, and I've always been a believer in kind of uh, lose it, uh, use it or lose it, and if you're in the broadcast spectrum, that involves serving the public interest. So uh, you know, my advice to uh, uh, the broadcast industry while we uh, are uh, uh, cogitating all of this and doing inventories and all of that is to make sure that that spectrum is well, that's, being used that's a to good serve point. the public interest, and then we can... Commissioner Cups, I'm not, I hate to be rude to you, um, but I only have 23 seconds left, and I want to follow up uh, on the affordability and how we're going to do that. And I thought the E-rate was the answer to that question. So in this discussion of affordability and take within urban cores and rural areas, has E-rate not been successful? E-rate has been a stunningly successful program, I do believe, and I think it's, uh, you talk about digital literacy and all of that, and uh, certainly E-rate is, uh, uh, is connected to that, but just from the standpoint of connecting uh, kids to the 21st century, it's been an outstanding success. Thank you very much, Mr. Terry. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. This has been uh, a very, uh, an excellent hearing. Uh, Ch Chairman Jelenkowski and the other commissioners, you may be aware of the joint efforts by this subcommittee and the subcommittee that I chair to draft uh, federal privacy legislation. In recent days, much has been made, much uh, has been made about the plan's proposal to condition future spectrum auctions for free broadband service around advertising business models. Um, if the FCC imposes conditions on spectrum, one at, uh, seven, at the 700 megahertz auctions requiring free broadband access for people who can't afford it, then one probable way to finance the purchase price would be through advertising-based services. The plan offers this as a proposed recommendation. However, if I am a bidder at the auction and I don't know what the final rules of the road would be with respect to protecting consumer privacy, then I might not be inclined to participate or to bid um, as much as I might uh, otherwise. This effectively puts the cart before the horse uh, and could open the doors to another set of unsuccessful uh, auctions. Uh, with the hopeful and passage of uh, privacy legislation, what impact do you think that, the, that this passage will have on uh, your auction design for the 700 megahertz license. The, the privacy issue is a very important one, and it is discussed in the plan. It's, it's one of the big looming topics that the plan does say uh, 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 needs to be addressed to give consumers and businesses the confidence they need to participate in a broadband future. So we're, 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 it's not... Um, uh, I think we're glad that uh, there's work proceeding on legislation, and I think, if I understand your point, it's that clarity around the rules of the road on privacy would have real benefits uh, to the business community and individuals as the broadband future rolls out, and I agree with that. Any other commissioner would uh, want to respond to that? All right, on to another matter. <clears throat> Uh, as you know, uh, uh, one of my observations is that the broadband plan places too much emphasis on the demand and the adoption side uh, without giving corresponding weight to factors that will stimulate entry by small businesses, including minority firms, minority-owned firms, and entrepreneurs. Small businesses are a critical part of the stimulus equation that can help to offset the huge numbers of layoffs that we witness uh, from uh, large carriers. Uh, and I wanted to ask uh, you, uh, uh, Chairman Jenikowski and, and uh, 
Mr. Cobbs, Mr. Cobbs, I uh, know the minority of, uh, ownership has been a real uh, area of concern for you over the years. And um, uh, how do you plan on addressing this stunningly silent omission in the national broadband plan? Broadband plan. If I may, sir, I, I, um, uh, I, I, I there's complete agreement on the importance of small businesses uh, and the challenges and opportunities around broadband. We held three workshops looking at the small business issues, and um, uh, and there is a discussion in 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 the plan. I'd, I'd be happy to follow up with you and, and make sure. But with respect to training, um, uh, information, digital literacy for small businesses. Um, uh, there are recommendations in the plan with respect to small business administration and joint activities, uh, extension programs, to make sure that small businesses get the information uh, that they need. Uh, there are several recommendations on that. And then with respect to the affordability issue that we heard from uh, small businesses, there are recommendations with respect to moving forward on competition issues to get more competition to help reduce the price. So, uh, uh, I, I hope the plan is uh, is not confusing on that, but but I uh, but I there's complete agreement on the importance of small businesses uh, in all the ways that you said, and uh, I hope we can follow up and uh, make sure that we're being as clear as we should be. And, and for my part, I, I commend the emphasis of the of the plan on small business. Uh, ever since I was Assistant Secretary of Commerce in the previous administration, Clinton administration, I've dealt a lot with small and medium-sized enterprise. They are the locomotive of the economy. They are the job creators. So getting broadband out there that can facilitate their business is an important priority. Also is making sure the small business is a participant in the building out of this infrastructure and, and gets its share of uh, activity uh, as we build out. Yeah, I, I, I only have a, I guess my time has expired. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Rush. The gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, had some of the same concerns that uh, Mr. Blunt had, uh, and I think that you all have addressed those questions. but. Obviously, on the, on the issue of the spectrum, uh, we can't afford to ignore the incredible opportunity that it has to connect folks uh, in rural uh, and low-income communities. And I think all of us uh, represent uh, some part of our district, most of us anyway, that uh, are rural uh, and low-income. And that's certainly the case in Vermont. And uh, you've heard this and you understand it, uh, but it's important for me to say it uh, so that folks back in Vermont appreciate uh, that we're on the job here uh, about the absolute necessity of treating us in many ways like electricity so that that opportunity to create jobs uh, comes to the rural communities. And I appreciate your concern on that. Uh, I want to ask you about this. Uh, the commission obviously recognizes and understands the, pro the, the problems in the wholesale market, particularly with high speed special access connections. Uh, in Vermont, we've established, uh, with the help of the governor and the, and the legislature, Republican and Democrat, the Vermont Telecommunications Authority, and it's identified the high cost of wireless backhaul as one of the most significant uh, potential barriers uh, to our success in Vermont in getting wireless service deployed in rural Vermont. So on the one hand, we're committed to the goal. On the other hand, we have a practical impediment uh, that really does require leadership and guidance uh, from you. Uh, and I just want to uh, kind of go down the line a little bit about um, uh, uh, your, your, your views on that. Uh, why don't we start at this end with uh, uh, Ms. Atwell Baker, who thank you for coming into my office and uh, saying hello. Absolutely. It was a great visit. I'm glad that we had the time. Um, special access is an important input into services, including wireless, and the backhaul is certainly important. It's something we're taking a look at. at. Um, we need to gather the data. We're in the process of doing that now to look at what parts need to be regulated, what parts need to unregulated. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be able to do this expeditiously. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Clyburn? Thank you. Uh, yes. As it relates to um, backhaul, um, I, I recognize the importance of that and, and recognize that uh, uh, that will it, it will increase competitive um, options and make uh, deployment um, the cost of deployment uh, lower. So I'm looking forward to uh, engaging um, more fully with that and to uh, get rid of some of the bottlenecks that um, cause. Yeah. 
Let me ask you, let me just elaborate on this, Mr. McDowell, when you do it. You know, when, when uh, in Vermont, we've been trying to uh, encourage some local generation of power, and then local generation, generators have to use the, the wires and poles uh, that were there uh, beforehand in a regulated uh, utility, and it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a practical challenge trying to figure out what's fair compensation on an asset that's been fully depreciated. Uh, and to some extent, these backhaul charges remind me of that whole battle that we went through. And uh, there's the property right, obviously, of the owner on the one hand. Uh, on the other, uh, there's the acknowledged and urgent necessity of not reinventing the wheel uh, and providing access to an infrastructure uh, so that all of the economy can prosper. And uh, do you have any thoughts on how to, how to thread that needle? A very perceptive question, actually. So when we talk about lofty and, and laudable goals in broadband, uh, sometimes it does come down to the nitty-gritty of things like pole attachments and access to rights of way. Well, that's what it is and, about. And special it? access, absolutely. So on the uh, the plan does tee up those issues. Uh, I don't want to steal the chairman's thunder what, you know, when or what we might be doing uh, going forward on, on pole attachments. I'll let him speak to that and things of that nature. Uh, with special access, for about three years now, I've been calling for a cell site by cell site, building by building mapping of mm -hmm. special access. The last time the Commission looked at the regulations was 1998. I want to commend the Chairman for uh, issuing a public notice to get into the next stage where we can actually make a very informed decision as to what to do next. Okay, great. Mr. Copps, thank well, you. Special Sorry. access, I think it's, it's time to do this. I'm pleased that the broadband uh, plan tees this up. Uh, we can't take forever on this. This has been a problem for a long time. The facts that we have seen in past years lead me to believe that maybe uh, some people are paying a lot more for this kind of access than they should be. If that's true, I don't think we should uh, uh, take forever to resolve that. Uh, I think we, we need to get the essential core of data we need uh, and then go ahead and act. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Janikowski. Uh, I, I agree with each of my colleagues. I think it's an example of the kind of issue, sort of a blood and guts issue, where government can play a positive role in promoting investment, promoting competition, and it has to roll up its sleeves with the data, tackle the rules. And so I think there's an opportunity on this issue and others for a very healthy discussion and debate that's focused on um, uh, uh, the barriers in the marketplace. Okay. Thank you. I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I thank the Commission. Thank you very much, Mr. Welsh. Uh, Chairman Dingell is... Uh, on his way, and we expect him to arrive momentarily for his round of questions. <laughs> right on time. Thank you, uh, Chairman Dingell. You're recognized for five minutes. For this hearing. Um, th th there's going to be a lot of yes or no questions, and I hope that our panel will be kind to me over this matter. Uh, Mr. Chairman Gadowski, Webster's Dictionary defines the word voluntary as being done, made, brought about, undertaken, etc., by one's own accord or by free choice. Is that the definition that would be applied to the word voluntary or voluntarily in the recommendations of the Commission's broadband, broadband plan? Yes. Uh, now, uh, the, so I assume that would apply then to the uh, questions where they're talking about voluntary channel sharing and uh, motivating existing licenses to voluntarily clear the spectrum. Am I right? Yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, the National Broadband Plan states if the FCC does not receive authorization to conduct incentive auctions or if the incentive auctions do not yield a significant amount of spectrum, the FCC should pursue other mechanisms. That's a quote. Now, uh, are these other mechanisms going to be voluntary, yes or no? Uh, I think that language speaks for itself. I'm sorry? I think that language speaks for itself. The other mechanisms would be determined in the future. All right. Uh, if these are not, or rather, are not voluntary, how would they then be accomplished? Uh, uh, sir, that would be speculation. I, I'm focused on a near-term win-win 
that works for broadcasters and that's done on a voluntary basis? Well, you understand uh, there is a concern here because everybody wants to know what these is going to, are going to uh, constitute. Now, would we assume then that these other mechanisms will be 100% voluntary or involuntary or what? I'd be speculating to talk about what would happen if we face a spectrum crisis in the country and what well, I we hope, decide to do. I that. hope you and the Commission understand that this is a point of no small importance. Now, to all of the witnesses, uh, and this again is a yes or no question, and ladies and gentlemen, I apologize if this is discourteous. Does the Commission possess the authority, whether under the Communications Act of 1934, the Telecommunications Act of 1996, or otherwise, with which to require broadband networks to unbundle access? Starting with you, Mr. Chairman, please. Yes or no? Well, that's a good, I, I'd, I'd like to be advised by council on that. I, uh, we've been focused on the broadband policies and... Uh, um... uh, I'll ask them that you submit that for the record. I will, Mr. Sir. Copps? I would say yes. Uh, I would say no. Uh, commissioner? I would say I would submit that later. And, and, and the last of our commissioners? Uh, no. Now, does the commission believe unbundling network access will have a chilling effect on further investments to expand broadband infrastructure? Again, with apologies, yes or no. I, I, I don't know that that lends itself to a yes or no because unbundling means so many different things to different people. Commissioner Copps? Uh, I think I would give the same answer and uh, a shorter answer would be not necessarily. <laughs> Commissioner? If, his, if history is our guide, yes. Uh, Commissioner? I echo uh, Mr. Copps' answer. Commissioner? Chilling, yes. Um, again, to all witnesses, does the commission eventually intend to require unbundled access to broadband networks? Um, yes or no? Uh, again, I think the, span, the plan speaks for itself and the plan does not speak about unbundled network elements. Commissioner Cox? I can't predict what the commission intends to do. I can't predict what the commission will do either. I am not sure at this time, thank you. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, my time's running out here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the National Broadband Plan mentions wireless communication services as a source of new spectrum. On February 16, 2010, I sent a letter to the Commission highlighting my concern that the opening of this spectrum for mobile broadband services may result in interference with satellite radio signals. Can you unequivocally assure me that this will not be the case? Yes or no? Uh, if the staff of the uh, agency says there's no interference, then there won't be interference. I, I didn't hear the answer, sir. Sorry, if the engineers at the FCC say there won't be interference, then I believe there won't be interference. Now, Mr. Chairman, will the Commission provide advance notice of the WCS rules, publish them, and allow for, uh, prior, for comment prior to their implementation? Yes or no? Uh, I, I believe I don't, don't see any reason why not. That's what we always do. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. My time's up, and you have been very kind, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I reiterate my request for uh, the privilege of, of sending a letter asking further questions to the Commission uh, and ask it to be inserted in the record. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Dingell. And the record of this hearing will remain open until such time as a letter has been sent to you containing questions that various members of the committee may decide to ask beyond the context of today's hearing. Uh, and until we have received your response to that letter, so when you receive it, please uh, be as prompt as you can. Uh, we thank you for your attendance here today and for sharing your views with us uh, extensively. We've been here now for about three and a half hours, and we have certainly been enlightened by the information you've provided, and hopefully you've been somewhat enlightened by the views we've expressed as well. Uh, we, uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, is recognized for a unanimous consent request. Oh, thank you for your for forbearance, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to enter into a record, uh, just for the history, uh, a letter from 2007 from this committee, a bipartisan letter to the FCC about the D-Block. Um, 
Uh, Chairman Janikowski, I just let me commend the staff for their public uh, safety proposal. Uh, Sixteen of us uh, from both sides of the aisle sent a letter to your predecessor recommending a very similar approach, and I'm optimistic that Congress will consider legislation authorizing first responders to use auction revenues to build a public safety network, and if possible, your uh, public safety and wireless staff could provide input to help us draft that. That would be appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stearns. A rather lengthy unanimous consent request uh, with, with, without objection. Uh, with thanks to the Commission, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Which president was buried wrapped in an American flag and a copy of the Constitution under his head? Andrew Johnson. Find these and other presidential facts in C-SPAN's newly updated book,